This is Joffrey Diamond Sewer, member of Parliament representing the Commonwealth in South Constituency and the Commonwealth in the Greater Massacre, and I'm an alternative minister for sports. One of my priorities is, as a minister is sports infrastructure at a regional level. So that in Arua, we have an international stadium, the same in Nikawa, the same in Masaka, that will help us to grow the sports more and more and more. And that's the role of the government. Another thing is about the tax waivers. When we look at other sectors we have in this country, other investors are given tax waivers. Other products come free of taxes, but sports is totally different. Sports is becoming professional. Sports is just growing in our country. So we need a greater attention there. That's why we call upon well, what we need. We get to build tax, tax waivers to the investors that come here. We remove taxes from all specific products that come into our country so that we can attract more investors into the sport. If we don't do that, we are going to lose many people and space is going to, to remain as a leisure activity. When we look at former activities, the way they look, my friend. a better system for them, financial system for them. They need, if you come on a national team, you need to be paid, you need to receive your pensions so that you can act as a good example to the younger generation. Thank you very much. And Dr. Batua Timothy Rusala, Member of Parliament, Ginger West Constituency. I'm the Shadow Minister of Health. I lead the entire opposition on matters on health. Uh, we've looked at budget priority number one as the need of functionalizing Healthy center falls. We've established that there is a relationship between dental care and many communicable diseases. If dental care is not well addressed, you now tend to have your heart diseased. You tend to have other organs diseased. So we want that service to be handled at healthy center falls. Maternal health to be handled there. There is a theater. So if it's supported with an ultrasound scan, that can be handled. There is an X-ray that should also complement theater. So if we functionalize health center phase, we shall reduce the convention at national referral and regional referral hospitals, and we shall address a very high number of citizens. Secondly, and we are very preventive rather than curative. So we want to strengthen the village health teams, the community health extensive workers. We are researching Uganda that has village health teams, each individual carrying a glucometer, a blood pressure machine, uh, being in a position to even understand and read the, you know, house oximeters, such that health is handled primarily at household levels and referrals can, effective referrals can be made thereafter. Uh, we want to eradicate malaria completely out of Uganda. Uh, our plan is that the mosquito is the enemy, and therefore we should spray the mosquito. It brings down the population below threshold that the disease of malaria simply gets eradicated. We are going to prioritize in the spring, and we are going for the large sources, large data sources. We go for the wetlands, the area spray over there, the other side of the there at massive scale. Once the large sources of mosquitoes are suppressed, the disease will be eradicated. We will build the human resource structure so that you access a medical personnel that uh, needs to address your health issue at the facilities that are at lower level. Last but not least, we are desirous to reduce the out of pocket spending. We know that largely, uh, most of the Ugandans are spending so much on health. We have interacted with those that have to sell some of their belongings, some of their properties are built to treat. They sell a, a cow 
pay you 100 medical costs. So we are going to design and bring in place a very good medical health insurance scheme. Thank you very much. Dr. Bed Bonica, the Shadow Minister for Agriculture. We are aware that 74% of our population is rural. Our priorities, number one, is to ensure that we provide water for production. This is water for irrigation, so that we can get our people from farming that depends on rain to farming that depends on irrigation. That will improve production and productivity for our people who are engaged in farming. Our second priority is to ensure that we invest in the storage system for the food. We need to invest in silos so that our people, they don't sell their foods while they are just harvested. We also want to reduce the losses which are post-harvest. We want to invest in the market access. Currently, because there is no traceability for our food products, we don't have a national food regulatory agency that also impedes our people and it uh, limits them in terms of market access. So we want to invest in an agency that is going to regulate food and food products in this country. That is going to be a priority. Thank you. 
We did have the National Bank for Agriculture, and there are people access commercial loans which don't which are not uh, which don't run with agriculture and the dynamics of agriculture. The government is talking about PBM and they want to invest over trillion shillings into PBM. This money alone is enough for us to establish the National Agriculture Bank so that our farmers can access affordable credit and it can be available for them. We want to invest in the area of agriculture inputs. Currently, we have some standard agriculture inputs on the market in terms of herbicides, acaricides, in terms of drugs. And these have affected the farmers in terms of losses, but also it affects the productivity of our farmers. So we want to invest in that area as a priority so that our farmers can afford can access affordable but quality agriculture inputs so that we can improve agriculture in this country. I want to thank you so much. Uh, my name is Honorable Nyakato Asnans. I'm the Woman Member of Parliament for Hoima Oil City and the Shadow Minister for Energy and Mineral Development. As the alternative government in the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, this coming financial plan to ensure that we compensate all the product affected persons along the pipeline and also all the product affected persons 
in the European areas like Karamoja, Russia, Mogendi, and Ruhoji. We also plan to ensure that we prioritize the issue of the refinery. We need the refinery as early as yesterday. The issue of local content is an issue which we feel we have to address in this coming finance area. And of course, the issue of the fuel reserves. We very well know that as a country, we have these reserves which were far back constructed in 1971 by uh, the, the, the former president, Ibrahim uh, Dada. So it's high time that as an alternative government, we prioritize the issue of the, uh, uh, establishing our own reserves, the new reserves, and to have capacity. Also, plan to ensure that we cut the power tariffs. The power tariffs are so high that uh, the vulnerable Ugandan cannot afford. It's so expensive, the process of sustainability. Just imagine the poor, just the single poor going at 720,000. It is too much money for a vulnerable Ugandan to afford. The issue of wind energy. Uh, wind energy, this electricity which has been produced is in the dams, but it has not been connected to the main grid. Uh, we are going to make sure that we prioritize, to ensure that uh, most of these dams have been connected to the main grid so that you can be able to consume this electricity. Thank you for your input and shadowing your staff for education. As the alternative to the education system, which is education and which is accessible to all, regardless of where they come from, who they are, what kind of disabilities they have. In this financial year, we are, we are prioritizing four issues. The first issue is the restoration of the inspector of schools department in the education sector. We know that actually the department of inspection is less funded. Inspection is not only limited to infrastructure, number of teachers, but also quality of education. The inspector department will be fully efficient. Secondly, we want to compatibilize the new university culture. There have been so many outlets from the teachers, the learners, and also those secondary who are very interested in education, but actually, it will not have to instruct learners in this new culture and become new from the teachers who are not really prepared. So, as the opportunity, we want to correct the system. In this coming time, inshallah. As the alternative, we want to increase the education grant for the economic development of schools at all levels. We are going to look at this so that we provide quality education to our learners. We want to put faith in schools and we are coming up with a policy which we are going to fund so that we can build up all our schools in the century. This is quite wonderful. To the district from a member of parliament, and also the alternative minister for water and environment. As an alternative government, we feel that we should concentrate on the same issues. One, we need to renovate, rehabilitate the already dilapidated ecosystems, especially forests. And then we have to evict. A distinguished guests, a very good morning, and you're very welcome to, to our function, which is about to start. It will not be my duty to welcome you, but I'm happy to have you here and to let you know that we shall be starting soon. But in the meantime, we'd like to invite you to join us for breakfast. Right behind this screen, we have got uh, tea and coffee, a few bites set up for you. We'd like to invite you in this time to please get yourself a cup of coffee or tea, and we shall be starting very shortly. We shall soon be joined by the leader of the opposition in parliament, and then we can start our function officially. Once again, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Go in coaches. We must regularize the surveys and boundary locations, such that the wisdom are aware. Those who have acquired the titles within these forest reserves and wetlands have to be evicted immediately. We are also looking at um, revamping the financing of climate change management actions. We are looking for finances out there 
if you just look in them, with our national budget, can we longer sustain the actions we feel uh, can be the resilience of our people? We are also uh, looking at um, uh, strengthening the meteorological services in Uganda because weather forecasts are very important to help our people decide the kind of activities that they can take part in. And the different sectors must be cognizant of the weather focus, how to build roads, how to construct houses. All this must, uh, in, uh, must be cognizant of the forecasts such that we have resilient constructions in roads, in, in, in the housing, and also agriculture. What is best for this place in this period is very important for us as we try to reduce poverty among the star population. Here are some of the salient uh, actions that we feel should take us in this coming financial year. I thank you. Um, my name is Kabir Frank, the Shadow Minister for the Youth and Children Affairs, the MP for Kassan South Constituency. Since the youth and the children compose the largest population in Uganda, we have the local issues that are affecting us and these cut across. We are looking at the problem of the child pregnancies and child marriage. This is affecting our communities and it has been uh, how can we just that we have been doing by the leader of the opposition in parliament. He has requested to come in and briefly mingle with you and interact with you before we officially start this function. So Leader of the opposition, you must welcome. These young cows, so that they can impact the communities where they, where they live, to so see that those that can uh, attain or go back to school also qualify to be uh, absorbed and adopted into the schools so that they can also attain a future in education. And this we are really need to go and push until we achieve the exact goal to see that everyone at least qualifies with a skill and the knowledge to run and contribute to the community. We are impacting on our ways that are measures that are going to ensure that the children and the young ones have uh, they have assurance for better life by looking into the health sector, looking at how government, uh, how in our government we can uh, reduce on the taxes on the things that are needed by mothers. For example, the mama kids, which are necessity to everyone. And now we are making uh, childbearing look like a business or a burden. So we have to use that and we look at it as a treasure because we are building for the nation. We are going to introduce the third person inclusion for fresh graduates in every office or in every sector to see that at least they get that chance to get experience, to reduce on the burden because some of these people have total lack of experience and the very skills that are being put are much further along and are not uh, observing the available number of groups who have been to, to, to reach out to, to, the, to go to the labor market. So you have to do that and we shall listen the first of all, to join the hand, to give an idea, to start a support hand, to come and influence because every idea, every effort counts in the fight to say that we have a better country and a better generation. Thank you. I'm Marika Yahamifa, Women MP Mukono District, Shadow Minister for Human Rights. Uh, we intend the Human Rights Committee to be turned into accountability committee. Um, that committee to be under the leadership of the open official opposition. Uh, we also intend to claim back the refund of the money that is deposited at court. Because you see, when we uh, have a case and then we second the case, for bail applications, you pay either cash or non cash bail. So the payment of cash. We pay in the bank, but that money is supposed to be refunded back to the clients. But in this case, they don't refund back. Uh, more to this, also, we want to create regional 
offices under the Human Rights Commission because Human Rights Commission has not too many uh, offices, but um, in cases that are probably in the northern region, it could be easier for them to go to that side and then present their case, then they can be helped instead of moving miles back to Kampala. Also, we are talking about, I want to talk about the electoral science, they need amendments really. We need amendments of uh, electoral science such that we could move um, a democratic or a legal kind of setup in our electoral processes. Um, lastly, but not least, also to set up national reparations program to address compensation of needs of the victims and claimants. Lastly, uh, to address the backlog issues, we want to uh, increase the procuring jurisdiction and um, save the magistrate's court. Because um, you could find in an area, it could be about one court, and then you have to walk miles. So if you put many other, not many, but some courts in some other areas to facilitate and let the people come and uh, register their cases to be heard, that would also help. I want to address this the proposition of um, the two commercial laws. For example, um, the security interests in the movable properties, movable properties act and the geographical indications act. So, for example, if Masaka is known to be um, growing mangroves, let us know that that region is for mangroves and be helped in that kind of setting. And if someone is maybe known for Simpson, let's know that that person, that that, that area, grow Simpson, and then we help them under the Geographical Indications Act. My name is Nichimuri Helen, a woman in the Parliament for Karangala District. I represent 84 islands, and I'm the Shadow Minister for Fisheries. As the alternative government, our intention is to ensure that we operationalize the Fisheries and Agriculture Act 2023 that was passed recently. Uh, we have seen quite a number of atrocities committed by the UPDF in the lake, and they are hindering the human rights of the people. So our intention is to make sure this is handled and it is followed. Uh, we intend to replace the operations of the UPDF with the uh, uh, fisheries protection unit that shall be trained, uh, it shall be uh, it shall be brought on board by the public service as the law says, and we shall also ensure that the beach management units are put back in the place or reinstated. Uh, secondly, we are looking at the fisheries fund. When we, we see, when we when we talk about uh, when we talk about agriculture, Uganda has focused so much on the crop and animal, including along the uh, fisheries sector. It has been really squeezed in there, and we all know that the fisheries sector has been uh, very instrumental in the in this Uganda's economy. Uh, we have the fisheries sector brings us at least two point five percent of the national GDP. Uh, I, I think it needs to be given more priority. That is what we are looking at. The, the fisheries fund aims at ensuring that at least the fishermen and women are given some, they are given soft loans to ensure that they can, they can, you know, they can buy fishing gears, they can buy fishing, uh, like fishing nets, engines, boats, uh, a small amount of money so that they can also you know, be part of this exercise that brings the economy of you know, the resources. Uh, the reason as to why we're going to legal fishing is because these things are expensive and the legal fishing deals are very cheap. I think it is unfair for the government to bring this from market for our people to buy and at the end of the day, a week or two, they are taken away from them, they are banned and they're thrown into prison. For me, I believe that is a violation of somebody's right. We do not let them access these if we don't want them to go fishing regularly. So, we, we as the alternative government, uh, suggest that I think that it is it, it is better we, we don't allow these illegal fishing nets into the country for our people not to access them. And then finally, um, we are we are we. We are going to decolonize the lots uh, from policy capitalists who have taken in the lot 
as their own back behind the as children. Them. Our people would have wanted to take on this, but it's the big fish out there, the big thing out there who is really doing the fishing themselves. And they've taken out our, our people, the Germans. So the indigenous fishermen of Kalangala district, of Namakido, of Bovina, and all these other fishing communities. So to me, I believe, as the minister in this sector, we need to take back power to our people, power to the fishermen, to open the law, to make sure these communities do not do it. Our people can do it. District and the Shark Minister for Defense and Veteran Affairs would like to prioritize three major activities. The first is to professionalize and have an early international government and ensure that so we have equal opportunities within the promotions uh, among the work of the by ensuring that we have deployment that follows the name of the latter, and we like to have an army which is non partisan and army which is subordinate to civilian authority and respects the democratically elected civilian leadership. We hope to do this by primarily reviewing and amending the new PDF Act, which acts. Uh, should uh, be in tandem with the policy that we are going to develop as a new defense policy. In that review, we will restructure the new PDF High Command to remove the permanent membership of the people of the force in dealing with the entire base because now we have transformed into a national army. So, no one person. We like to call permanent membership of the high command. We shall reform the military justice system, that is the court martial, to ensure that only people who are in service are tried before the court martial to enhance their discipline. We shall not try civilians before the general court martial. And uh, we should not forget the importance of the officers that have served and have retired. So we shall have a special program to take care of our veterans. We believe that uh, the foot soldiers, the privates, those who are battling the field deserve to be equally enhanced. And we believe that this enhancement should be approached and commensurate with the current economic challenges. I am Karim Masara, the member of parliament representing industrial division in Bali City, and the shadow minister of tourism and world wealth. And one of the things that have come up with that I believe um, we should focus on as the opposition is the, the tourism kind of development. As a country right now, uh, there is a lot of money potential into tourism kind of development. Particularly tourism kind of development, I'm talking about um, moving away from the traditional things like uh, venture into wildlife, we can invest more, much more into other things like um, culture tourism, food tourism. Uh, there are tools that, we, that I believe we need to develop. There are tools like the Lanzari Trail, the Mount Elbon, the Wanale Trail. Currently, uh, there is little or undeveloped uh, infrastructure in the tourism sector. We need to do the uh, the nature of the national park, you will find the roads are completely impossible. You will find that you cannot find what I'm thinking in this area. You will find that there is a problem with ICT, there is a problem with drink and with nature. So, we are as a minister of tourism, we are selling out experience. We will want the tourists to get a proper experience once they're into the country. So, I believe this is a field that we could tap into. And uh, lastly, I believe uh, as a shadow minister of tourism, we need to invest more into uh, promotion and marketing of tourism and only look at the general politics of the country. This is impacting negatively the tourism industry in the country. So, as a country, this is something we need to do much more better. The history of the country, we need to, to define it now because uh, the people out there have negative impacts. So, you know, you can there is political unstable, this and this happening in the country, so this negatively impacts on the country.
also the shadow minister for East African Community Affairs. So I'm here to present our budget priorities for the alternative government. And the first one is definitely to bring the uniformity in the member states uh, to have the respect of rule of law and the uh, human rights, uh, because some countries do not respect it. Uh, do not respect human rights, and that is not easy to combine one that respects or the one that, for example, has time limits. Kenya Tanzania has time limits, and Uganda doesn't. It's not easy to integrate the two when the software is different, the political software is different of each country. So we need to work on the software to make sure that we promote the hardware also of the different countries. That is very easy to integrate the two countries or the seven countries at large. Secondly, we would like to fund an uh, activity that will advocate for the development of the infrastructure, the infrastructure, common infrastructure for all the seven member states. That is roads, road network, that is a uh, uh, for example, the standard big level, if it is across, if we use the movement of goods and services across the country, the countries, and then to also allow free movement of goods and services of the member states, a uniform custom union, and the standardization of uh, also goods and services produced so that we have quality. Our aim is to see Africa as a bigger market a safer place and a really good towards the destination for everyone. Asante sana kwa kumisikiliza. My name is Kalia Abubeka, in the Parliament uh, Organ of Constituency in Kampala, the Shadow Minister for Kampala and Metropolitan Affairs. We have put uh, most of our uh, emphasis on the key priority areas uh, that include the following. Uh, we in the city roads, Together with the government system, we all know that uh, uh, it is very unfortunate that in this 21st century, that Kampala still has uh, roads that are still flooding. So, we are putting that as a serious meeting that uh, we need to address at some time. We also have that the informal sector uh, uplifting the area of the informal sector, and we will talk about the informal sector, and uh, that is uh, mostly the vendors in the city. We have seen uh, cases here having uh, a big fights uh, between vendors and uh, the officials of KCCO. So, we are putting government to task for them to procure uh, a minimum of pre markets in each and every division. Uh, another matter is public transport, it's one of the challenges that we have. And we talk about public transport. Uh, we, we have, uh, we, we, we need uh, taxis, uh, buses, portabilas. So, uh, that would be a lot of issues of public transport in the in government uh, uh, statements. But for us as the provincial government, we see it uh, uh, very critical that we need to have a very systematic. Uh, when it comes to construction of, of the roads, we need to uh, uh, things for our buses, for the buildings, and, uh, and, and, and others. So it's, it's another serious uh, matter that we are looking at as uh, the provincial government. And uh, the issue of uh, uh, the need Private uh, developers uh, in the international uh, programs. So there are many, many entities that we want to work with the uh, CCA as an institution. But there's no policy that has been given in place to make sure that uh, we are released we have private developers. Because uh, the KCC has a lot of the uh, anti that is very unutilized. So our concern is to have private developers to make sure that uh, we work with them. So that it also increase in the generation and benefit of our city. Thank you very much. Santi Sanamu, the good land, bless the city of Uganda. Uh, Chuanka Abdala, representing the people of Makono North, and the Shadow Minister in China Affairs, a uh, man in the docket of uh, police, entire uh, police prisons, Nira 
and immigration. Uh, basically, we, we intend to analyze issues to build human rights. As we are aware, some emotions have been gained them, it has been conducted. Uh, now, several developments are unknown. So, we intend to ensure uh, that we put that to an end. Uh, we intend to fight prison uh, money to ensure that police, uh, host police and prisoners are worked upon uh, their housing facilities. We intend to, to construct federal housing facilities at the same time to ensure that uh, the movement of police from the sub county level where they were shifted to the villages and, and, and courses is simplified by purchasing several vehicles, by purchasing several motorcycles, to enable them monitor security uh, in the sub counties and parishes and the villages, and thereby uh, putting our people in safe hands uh, in regards to their life and property. Uh, as far as the NGO uh, Bureau, we intend to move the motion to uh, amend the NGO Act to ensure that. It becomes a running registration, registration center. One of the people running civil societies, or even trans civil societies, they don't run to the district, to the sub counties, and to the national level to register. We want to make it a one stop center at the national level, whereby management will go and work there and then. Uh, in the Equal Economist Commission, as we are working on the Commission, up to now to now say constituted, we intend to push hard and make it fully constituted. Uh, to enable it uh, uh, solve uh, the, the insurgencies which are left, right, and center, border to border, which even cut across the border to the Democratic Republic of Congo and Kamarokanamoja. My name is Chia Gahila Rinosen, the MP Maokota North, and the Shadow Minister for Arts and Culture. I represent the creative world, and as the Shadow Minister for Arts and Culture, I want to talk about the most valuable industry that we need to empower in our government. We need to begin with the implementation of the popular law. There is already an existing law that we want to invest in its amendment so that it fits the modern time, so that the creatives are protected, their works are protected, and they can benefit from all their energy and creatives. We want to invest in the production. You can't talk about the arts or creative world when the government has nothing like a production house. So we want to regionalize production houses such that all the talented people out there can benefit from government resources by accessing modern technology that can only be facilitated and uh, uh, given by government. We want to also invest in the culture preservation and promotion. Culture is eroded. And it is our mandate to make sure that we preserve and promote culture. You will find that schools no longer have this curriculum. We want to first of all, uh, first of all, go back to schools to make sure that we have these cultural festivals. We have national festivals, regional festivals, such that we interface with the different cultures and make sure that we promote them. Furthermore, we want to invest in the uh, space that incorporates all the disciplines. You know, when we talk about creatives, people want to use it. But there are many disciplines in the creative world that need to be incorporated and allowed so that when we form a place to help this sector, we have a real streamlined industry with a policy that can help us govern and monitor its uh, developments in, in, uh, and see how we can boost it further. Otherwise, we're going to my country. I mentioned the Fortune and Trust, the Women Member of Parliament, Treasurer District, and um, the, the Shadow Minister for Gender, Labor, and Social Development. As the Minister of Gender, Labor, and Social Development, my planning priorities are basically four. One is to put up gender based violence, and this is basically to rehabilitate the victims of gender based violence by institutionalizing the centers, the GBT centers, to provide psychosocial support, but mostly to provide skilling. To retool this but to make sure that they cope up with life after they can make a living, they can move on. Secondly, women with persons with disabilities and children with disabilities provide a, an all round education system that can provide education to ensure that there are facilities in education centers. 
for PWDs and CWDs, but mostly to construct centers for these persons, still to rehabilitate them, to make sure that they receive the skills that they need in their situation, that they can cope up with life. And the part of labor basically is to cater for the labor externalization sector. We have so many Ugandans who are going to work abroad in Arab countries elsewhere. We need to fund this sector and make sure we come up with a law that will regulate the sector because it brings in so much money, it's going to do so much for our GDP. So we need to fund it to make sure that we cater for the welfare of our Ugandans who go to work abroad. And when it comes to social protection, basically we are looking at a holistic social protection policy that is going to cater for all Ugandans in the formal and informal sector. And this is mainly to ensure that Ugandans contribute to their social welfare and the government contributes to Ugandan social welfare in all aspects of life. So that in case we ever come up with a situation, a uh, sort of a pandemic, we are well catered for as Ugandans and we do not have to go into a crisis. The Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development is a people-centered ministry. It touches the lives of each and every Ugandan. So as the government, we have to make sure that we invest in this ministry because it is the people who fund the government and we should give back to them to ensure their welfare in all aspects of life. Accountable, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Moada Nkumungu, the Sabo Minister for Foreign Affairs. I'm a member of Parliament, Sabo the Counter East. For the sake of foreign affairs, allow me to outline the two priorities we have and we intend to consider. One, we want to look at ratification of treaties. Uganda has the obligation to be part of the global setup and global engagements, including treaties. As we, as, as we speak now, none of the treaties are ratifiable by, by Uganda. Specifically, those are ratifiable by cabinet and executive have not been ratified. We want to prioritize and, and push forward the ratification of such treaties remain the reserve of parliament of Uganda. Equally, what are the aspect of economic and commercial diplomacy? We have misguided funding for economic and commercial diplomacy. As we speak now, Ugandan agricultural producers and traders can't effectively export to European markets simply because, and among others, we lack certification procedure. As we speak, National Bureau of Standards refused to certify products meant for foreign markets, especially agricultural products, and in events, and, and, and as a result, Many of our traders and exporters incur huge costs of destruction for commodities which don't pass the test while they reach European markets. Three, we want to look at issues of labor externalization. As we, as we speak now, thousands of our nationals are, are externalized for labor, but majority of them end up crying. We don't have a comprehensive, enforced, and, and well planned labor externalization policy. In equal way, we speak about uh, bilateral agreements with other countries. Those which have been negotiated have not been enforced. And the argument has been lack of budget. And some are not, have not been even negotiated and enforced. So you have to prioritize on, on, on supporting such policies based on realization of people's centered values. You want to focus on mission properties. As we begin with Uganda is hiring and renting properties and, and, and embassies for mission properties, expensively, the cost of hiring and renting some of these embassies embassies is quite higher than the cost of purchase and acquisition. So we have to prioritize and save taxpayers' money that acquiring the must acquire. And in countries where you have mobile properties like in Kenya, Tanzania, among others, we prioritize on using our own properties than using our properties for rent, whereas we hire and rent properties for mission, for missions and, and, and embassy projects and work. Let's we have to focus on voting, realization of rights of Ugandans abroad. The Ugandans have the right under the constitution to own and to, to, to have dual nationality. The Ugandan who acquires another nationality doesn't lose his, his or her rights to decide for the nation of our country. As we speak now, the Ghana is going to vote right in the diaspora. So we have to prioritize on a legal, legal framework and amendment where the Ghana is are also allowed and mandated to vote among others. My name is Santa Opet. I'm the MP for a real constituency, a week for People's Progressive Party. I'm a Oshadu Minister for Special Regions. The Special Regions are Northern Region, Karamoja Region, Oso Region, Bunyan Region, and Bunyan Triangle. These are all special regions because of the sufferings they had all along. 
and the most important, it is because of the war. And to us, these regions are underfunded. For example, if we look at the compensation started in 1996, up to be to do as a speak, there is still compensation in the triangle. So you want to this issue with the staff. The compensation of not going to has also taken long. So we generally have not got compensation for the animals, the animals, and actually said we don't have no compensation. Article 242 of the constitutions provides for the establishment of disaster management commission. So the commission is not in place to oversee the which is in OPM. You find that instead of the disaster management commission to oversee, now the disaster management instead of so that is commission is set up in that place to oversee them. You have ships and so forth. The commission can handle that. There is a little which has been appointed for Disaster officers. Thank you. My name is Yusuf Fonsigami. I'm a member of parliament for Marikota County South. I'm also the Shadow Minister of Works and Transport. I also do sit on the Physical Infrastructure Committee of Parliament. Uh, our priority as a county of government is here to put a lot of consideration in working on feeder roads. Uh, which access uh, production areas of our people and to ensure that also access markets. Unfortunately, these roads are not funded at all. Uh, a lot of emphasis is now being put on uh, highways, and we believe that is not in good faith, where the prices are really highly inflated, and the highways are really meant maybe uh, to access towns and uh, land centers. The majority of the people uh, in the villages, the villages, even just in the area of so we believe that we should put emphasis at least eighty percent in maintaining those roads. We also believe that we should really put emphasis in acquiring equipment and maintaining the equipment. Uh, what is happening that in the entire country? The districts without NOD equipment, especially the new districts. You find even the old districts are lacking. You find just one builder uh, in the district. So, we believe that if you want to, to ensure that buildings which are uh, constructed and maintained, specifically the modern or global roads, you must have equipment and work stations in the respective regions. So, the budget has to be adjusted by looking at accessing markets. And this can only be done by looking at what the roads instead of emphasizing uh, good roads. So my name is Joyce Naga, I'm to I am the running member of parliament from the Tiana district and the Shadow Minister for Information and Anti-Corruption. In the anti-corruption docket, uh, in our priorities, we intend to cause a national reparation commission in this country to ensure that we extend amnesty to those who have been documented under the laws who have stolen public funds. We give them the opportunity to give us part of the money they stole, uh, but also to fail when the law can take its course. Uh, we are looking at uh, having performance based uh, contracts for all the people who will be doing work, public work, work for the public, for the government. Um, we are looking at strengthening the e governance issue, especially when it comes to procurement. Uh, so that all procurements, public procurements, are really done under an e government system to be followed up very uh, properly. Um, but we're also looking at having a mandatory lifestyle edit. We need to ensure as a country that public sector workers, the money, the income they generate, the income they get is proportionate to their wealth. And then when we go to the ICT information, of course, we are looking at a number of things, particularly on strengthening and um, extending infrastructure across the entire country. We need to ensure that we have an ICT infrastructure that can only be a majority of Ugandans 
to access internet services, to access ICT services, but also to bring down the cost of internet, to bring down the cost of ICT services, but also to bring down the cost of ICT devices so that they can be affordable to most of the Ugandans uh, to benefit the entire country. Uh, we want to see that the UCC tribunal is in place and operational. It's been talked about for a number of years. It needs to be operational. So we want to address issues that are not among the Muslim practitioners. But also, it's not just about the UCC tribunal. It's also about the UCC Act. We need to amend it to serve its purpose. We are looking at introducing a social media charter. This is me, I'm very sure I'm new to Ugandans. A social media charter, first of all, to ensure that Ugandans enjoy the freedom of expression, enjoy the freedom of speech, but also enjoy the freedom when we're putting into consideration that other people with whom we interact, with whom we enjoy these rights, enjoying the right expression, enjoying the uh, freedom of expression, we are putting into consideration other people, we are protecting your beings from the aspects of social media use. Our distinguished guests, once again, very good morning to you, and you're most welcome to the presentation of the alternative budget priorities for financial year 23-24. Shortly, we shall be joined by a few more eminent uh, guests, including the party presidents, and then we shall be ready to start. For those of you who came in a little after the first announcements, once again, you're most welcome. We have good breakfast that is prepared for you. And we kind of ask that you get a cup of tea or coffee behind the screens here. Now, for those of you who are here for the first time, you might not be familiar with the geography. Our restrooms, our washrooms are also behind the screen most adjacent to the stage we have here. So once the party presidents, the leader of opposition, and all the other guests have joined us here, we shall go straight into the program, where we shall start with anthems followed by prayers, and then our function for the day can officially begin. Once again, you're most welcome. 
and we're happy to have you here. Thank you. I <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
distinguished guests, could I kind of ask that you take up your seats? We are ready to begin. So distinguished guests, uh, shortly, before I invite our guests to come to the front, we're going to have the anthems played, the Uganda anthem followed by the East African anthem, and then we shall have a prayer, and I shall invite our guests to come and join us here. So in all humility, could I kind of ask that you rise to your feet for the playing of the Uganda anthem and the East African anthem. Please, I'd like to invite uh, Douglas to kindly come and give us an um, opening prayer. Thank you, God. And providential goodness has appointed the offices of leaders and government 
of society, the just government of humanity, and the searching to look at you and you and now the deliberation is so just and faithful. I stop at your library. I was the interest in her charge. Amen. Thank you very much. Please uh, take your seats for now. The leader of the opposition in parliament, the heads of our political parties present, representatives of government, members of the diplomatic corps, the shadow cabinet, members of parliament, cultural leaders present, civil society, our local leaders, ministries, departments, and agencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, you are most welcome to this presentation of the alternative budget priorities for financial year 2023-2024 under the auspices of the office of the leader of the opposition in parliament. I know some of you are very surprised that we have such an elaborate, well-planned function, but this is partly because this is a constitutional function, and this is a, in section 6E4 of uh, the Administration of Parliament Act. It provides that the Office of the Leader of Government Business will hold government in check, but also provides that they will provide uh, alternative policies. And today is one of those days when we shall be listening to the policies that are being presented here. Now, before I invite uh, Honorable Bagala to come forward to introduce the Shadow Cabinet, I would like to just uh, highlight a few lesser but also really important motives. The office, uh, of the, the office of the leader of the opposition is composed of uh, several people, not just politicians, but also technical, non-political staff. So I would just like them to stand up for recognition. Uh, they're led by Mr. Peter Busiku, who's the director. Wherever you are, you can just stand up and wave to, to the group here. Uh, distinguished guests, these are the persons who support the office of the leader of the opposition as technical staff, and they have ensured that you have a beautiful function for today. Now, once again, before we invite our guests to come to the front, allow me to first uh, invite Honorable uh, Joyce Bagala, who is uh, the Minister, Shadow Minister for Information and Anti-Corruption, to kindly come and introduce uh, the Shadow Cabinet. Thank you very much, Peter. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You are welcome to the first ever Opposition Budget Day. And uh, I'd like to first of all appreciate the technical team of the Office of the Leader of the Opposition for working tirelessly to put together what we have put together and what we are going to present to the public. My name is Joyce Bagala in Tuatua. I am the Shadow Minister for Information and Anti-Corruption, and I coordinate information and all the activities of the opposition in Parliament. We have had a long journey of this budget day, but I'm glad that the day is here. I know that previously we would critic the preparations of government, but we made a decision to tell the public, to tell Uganda and to tell the entire world what we would do if we were in power. I know that Ugandans have actually uh, preferred the opposition, but they don't know. Many people say we are very uh, used to criticizing without really giving alternatives. And today we want to tell the world that if we're in power, this is how we'd want to run the country. This is how we'd run the government. 
these are the real issues that we would handle. And this budget is a budget, is a budget that is premised on human rights. It's a human rights based budget and the leader of your position in parliament uh, is going to be presenting uh, that budget today. May I then introduce the shadow cabinet, uh, starting with uh, the opposition chief whip, the Honorable John Baptist Nambeche. They are going to stand here for all of us to um, see them and to understand what they do and their role and to appreciate them for work well done. Uh, the Honorable Manje Chirakutika, who is the deputy chief whip, the Honorable Ibrahim Semjunanda, who is the whip for the Forum for Democratic Change, the Honorable Peter Okot, who is the whip for the Democratic Party, the Honorable Santa Alum Sandra Ogwang, the whip for the Uganda People's Congress, the Honorable Asman Basarirwa is the uh, whip for JEMA, the Honorable Santa Okot, the whip for PPP, and those are the six political parties uh, with whom we work. We also have representatives to other parliaments and organizations, the Honorable Flavia Naragare Karure, the Roman MP for Kassanda is the Interparliamentary Union representative, the Honorable Patrick Insamba Oshare, he is the representative for the Pan-African Parliament, the Honorable David Richams Karwanga is the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association representative, the Honorable Hassan Chirumira, the Organization of Islamic Oppression representative, the Honorable Kazire Bashir, the EU Parliament representative, the Honorable Asha Aisha Karanda Narure, the Parliamentary Pension Scheme representative, the Honorable Zake Francis Boteri is our commissioner. And then we have a number of shadow ministers who will also join the team here, so you can see them. The Honorable Betty Ito Nalima is the local government minister. The Honorable Francis Kataraz Katongole is the East African Community Affairs Minister. The Honorable Abed Wunika is our Minister for Agriculture. The Honorable Fortunate Nantongo Wills is the Gender, Labor and Social Development Minister. The Honorable Shamim Malende, who is unfortunately unwell, is the Minister for Justice and Constitutional Affairs. The Honorable Dr. Timothy Lusara Batu is our Minister for Health. The Honorable Helen Nachimoli is our Minister for, um, for Animal Industry and Fisheries. The Honorable Hanini Fanarukeira is the Minister for Human Rights. The Honorable Brenda Nabukenya from Lugero is our Minister for Education. The Honorable Ronald Balmanzo is our Minister for Lands and Housing. The Honorable Hilary Chiaga, also known as Dr. Hilderman, is our Minister for Culture and Performing Arts. The Honorable Jonathan Odur, the Minister for Defense and Veteran Affairs, the Honorable Mawada Nkunji, our Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Yusuf Nsirambi is our Minister for Works and Transport, the Honorable Abdul Kakawaya, Minister in Charge of KCC Affairs, the Honorable Francis Mujuche is our Minister for Trade and Industry, the Honorable Atkins Katusare is our Minister for Public Service, the Honorable Derek Nyako, is our Minister for Presidency and Security, the Honorable Anna Adeke Ibadu, the Minister for Cooperatives and Microfinance, the Honorable Frank Karuye, is our Minister for Youth and Children Affairs, the Honorable Asnansi Nyakato, is our Minister for Energy and Minerals, the Honorable Geoffrey Kayemba Solo, is our Minister for Sports, the Honorable Santa Okot, is our Minister for Special Regions. And then we have Accountability Committee leaders. And uh, we have Honorable Meda Luida Segona, who is the chairperson of Park Central, Public Accounts Central. The Honorable Joel Senyani is our chairperson for Kosase. The Honorable Betty Nambo Zerachideke is our minister, is our chairperson for Government Assurances. And uh, the Honorable Lucia Kelo as Vice Chair, Vice Chair Person Kosase. Uh, the Honorable Asman Basai who is the Queen for Joma, is also the Vice Chair Person of Park Central. And then the Honorable um, Joseph Sawongo is the Vice Chair Person of Government Assurances. Then the Honorable, uh, Honorable Semakula Lutamaguzi 
is the vice chairperson of the park local government, uh, while the Honorable Gilbert Olama is the chair designate of park local government. Those are, that is the shadow cabinet, and it includes everyone, our representatives to other parliaments and organizations, our committee leaders, the real cabinet, and then the opposition whips. You're welcome, and thank you very much for work well done. The team here is part of the efforts that made this day happen, especially the content of this budget. You're welcome, and thank you very much. Apologies, there is uh, just one member of the cabinet that was not um, introduced, and that is the Honorable Wilfred Niwagara. He's uh, our shadow attorney uh, general. <laughs> yeah, and he's present. You're welcome. Yeah. I think in the lineup, I also did not see uh, Honorable Joyce Bagala, <laughs> who is our, our Shadow Minister for Information and Anti Corruption. Let's give her a round of applause, please. There is a way you can always tell when somebody is important is about to enter the room or someone has entered the room. So it uh, gives me pleasure to now ask the leader of opposition to come and take his seat and also have the leaders of the different political parties come and take their seats. I'm sure you have noticed that we have been joined by the president of the National Unity Platform, Honorable Chavlani Robert Sentamu. I, I think you can give a better round of applause than that. Yeah. So let me invite uh, other political party leaders to please come and take your seats. Our distinguished guests, um, just so you know, I shall just uh, read out all the political party leaders that we expect to, to be seated up the front uh, in no particular order. For the PPP, uh, Mr. Saddam Gaida, who is uh, the acting president. For the Justice Forum, uh, Mr. Katerega Mohammed, who is the SG and also acting president of the party. For the older, the older parties, Uganda People's Congress, Dr. Kilama Omoro Matthias. I believe we shall be joined by the Democratic Party president. <laughs>
Um, like I was saying, we shall be joined uh, from the Democratic Party by Honorable Nobat Mao. He's not here yet, but he will be with us shortly. Uh, for the Forum for Democratic Change, we've got uh, Honorable Doreen Nyanjura. You're most welcome. Yeah. And for the National Unity Party, Honorable Chabulani Robert Sentamu, who is no stranger here. Yeah. You are all most welcome, and we're honored, and this, uh, honored to have your distinguished presence here with us today. Now, our honorable members, our guests, today we're here to listen to the different alternatives as presented by the Office of the Leader of the Opposition. Before we hear from the Finance Minister, I would like us to turn our attention to the screens that we have to the sides, and we shall have a playback of the different shadow ministers and what their priorities are for this coming year. Please. So my name is Joyce Bagala Antwatwa. I am the Roman member of parliament for Nitiana district and the Shadow Minister for Information and Anti-Corruption. Under our anti-corruption docket, uh, in our priorities, we intend to cause a national reparation commission in this country to ensure that we extend amnesty to those who have been documented under the laws to have stolen public funds. We give them the opportunity to give us part of the money they stole. Uh, but also to fail, then the law can take its course. Uh, we are looking at uh, having performance based uh, contracts for all the people who will be doing work, public work, work for the public, for the government. Um, we are looking at strengthening the e governance issue, especially when it comes to procurement, uh, so that all procurements, public procurements, are really done under an e government system to be followed up very uh, properly. Uh, but we're also looking at having a mandatory lifestyle audit. We need to ensure as a country that public sector workers, the money, the income they generate, the income they get is proportionate to their wealth. And then when we go to the ICT information, of course, we are looking at a number of things, particularly on strengthening and um, extending infrastructure across the entire country. We need to ensure that we have an ICT infrastructure that can enable a majority of Ugandans to access internet services, to access ICT services, but also to bring down the cost of internet, to bring down the cost of ICT services, but also to bring down the cost of ICT devices so that they can be affordable to most of the Ugandans uh, to benefit the entire country. Uh, we want to see that the UCC tribunal is in place and operational. It's been talked about for a number of years. It needs to be operational. This will help arbitrate issues that arise among the media practitioners. But also, it's not just about the UCC tribunal. It's also about the UCC Act. We need to amend it to serve its purpose. We are looking at introducing the social media charter. This is new, I'm very sure, uh, new to Ugandans. A social media charter, first of all, to ensure that Ugandans enjoy the freedom of expression, enjoy the freedom of speech, but also enjoy the freedom when they put into consideration the other people with whom they interact, with whom they enjoy this right, enjoying the right to expression, enjoying the uh, freedom of expression, we are putting into consideration other people, not protecting the government's social media use. This is Joseph Kalemasu, member of parliament representing the South constituency of the city of Masaka. One of my problems is as a minister is space infrastructure at a regional level. So that in Arua, we have an international stadium, the same in Nikama, the same in Masaka, that will help us to grow the sports more and more and more. And that's the role of the government. Another priority is about the tax waivers. When we look at other sectors we have in this country, other investors are given tax waivers. Other products come through taxes, but space is totally different. Space is growing professional. Space is just growing in our country. So we need a greater attention there. That's why we call up them. We what we need. We need to move boxing to tax waivers to investors that come here. We need boxes from all space products that come into our country so that we can attract more investors into the sport. 
If we don't do that, we are going to lose many people and space is going to, to remain as a leisure activity. When we look at former activities, the way we look by film, we don't, we don't need to tell one person, you need to, to, to join the sports. We are just suffering. They, they have carried the national flag, they have marketed the other everywhere. So we need a better, team, a better system for them, a financial system for them. They need, if you come on a national team, you need to be paid, you need to receive your patients so that you can act as a good example to the younger generation. Thank you very much. And Dr. Batua Timothy, the Salaman of Parliament, Ginger West Constituency. I'm the Shadow Minister of Health. I lead the entire position on matters on health. Uh, we've looked at budget priority number one as the need of functionalizing health centre funds. We've established that there is a relationship between dental care and non communicable diseases. If dental care is not well addressed, you now tend to have your heart diseased. You tend to have other organs diseased. So we want that service to be handled at health center force. Maternal health to be handled there. There is a theater. So if it's supported with an ultrasound scan, that can be handled. There is an X-ray that should also complement theater. So if we functionalize health center phase, we shall reduce the condition at national referral and the regional referral hospitals, and we shall address a very high number of citizens. Secondly, and we are very preventive rather than curative. So we want to strengthen the village health teams the community health extensive workers. We have visited Uganda that has village health teams, each individual carrying a glucometer, a blood pressure machine, uh, being in a position to even understand and read the, you know, house oximeters, such that health is added by maladies at household levels and referrals can, effective referrals can be made thereafter. Uh, we want to eradicate malaria completely out of Uganda. Uh, our plan is that the mosquito is the enemy, and therefore we should spray the mosquito. We bring down the population below the threshold that the disease of malaria simply gets eradicated. We are going to prioritize in the spring, and we are going for the large sources, large data sources. We go for the wetlands. Do any spray over there, do a decide over there at massive scale. Once the large sources of mosquitoes are suppressed, the disease will be eradicated. We will build the human resource structure so that you access a medical personnel that uh, needs to address your health issue at the facilities that are at lower level. Last but not least, we are desirous to reduce the out of pocket spending. We know that largely. Uh, most of the companies are spending so much on health. We have interacted with those that have to sell some of their belongings, some of their properties are built to treat. They sell a, a cow to handle medical costs. So we are going to design and bring in place a very good medical health insurance scheme. Thank you very much. Dr. Bob Monica, the Shadow Minister for Agriculture. We are aware that 74% of our population is rural. Our priorities, number one, is to ensure that we provide water for production. This is water for irrigation, so that we can get our people from farming that depends on rain to farming that depends on irrigation. That will improve production and productivity for our people who are engaged in farming. Our second priority is to ensure that we invest in the storage system for the food. We need to invest in silos so that our people, they don't sell their foods while they are just harvested. We also want to reduce the losses which are post-harvest. We want to invest in the market access. Currently, because there is no traceability for our food products, we don't have a national food regulatory agency that also impedes our people and it uh, limits them in terms of market access. So we want to invest in an agency that is going to regulate food and food products in this country. That is going to be a priority. Currently, we don't have the National Bank for Agriculture, and our people access commercial loans, which don't, which are not 
which went wrong with agriculture and the dynamics of agriculture. Government is talking about PBM and they want to invest over trillion shillings annually into PBM. This man alone is enough for us to establish a national agriculture bank so that our farmers can access affordable credit and it can be available for them. We want to invest in the area of agriculture inputs. Currently, we have substandard agriculture inputs on the market in terms of herbicides, acaricides, in terms of drugs. And these have affected the farmers in terms of losses, but also it affects the productivity of our farmers. So we want to invest in that area as a priority so that our farmers can afford, can access affordable but quality agriculture inputs so that we can improve agriculture in this country. I want to thank you so much. Uh, my name is Honorable Benyakato Asnans. I'm the Woman Member of Parliament for Hoima Oil City and the Shadow Minister for Energy and Mineral Development. As the alternative government in the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, this coming financial plan to ensure that we compensate all the project affected persons along the pipeline and also all the project affected persons in the new open areas like Karamaja, Bushia, Novembe, and Ruhoju. We also plan to ensure that we prioritize the issue of the refinery. We need the refinery as early as yesterday. The issue of local content is an issue which we feel we have to address in this coming financial year. And of course, the issue of the fuel reserves. We very well know that as a country, we have those reserves which were far back constructed in 1971 by the, the, the former president. So it's a high time that as an alternative government, we prioritize the issue of the, uh, the establishing our own reserves, the new reserves, and to higher capacity. We also plan to ensure that we cut the power tariffs. The power tariffs are so high that uh, a vulnerable government cannot afford. It is so expensive, the process of sustainability. Just imagine the poll, just a single poll going at 720,000. It's too much money for a vulnerable government to afford. The issue of wind energy. Uh, wind energy, this electricity which has been produced is in the dams, but it has not been connected to the main grid. Uh, we, need, we are going to make sure that we prioritize to ensure that uh, most of these dams have been connected to the main grid so that Ugandans can be able to consume this electricity. My name is Thank you for your district and shopping minister for education. As the alternative, we want to sign up for education sector, which is for education, and it is accessible to all, regardless of where they come from, who they are, what kind of disabilities they have. In this financial year, we are prioritizing four issues. The first issue is the restoration of the inspector of schools. Department in the education sector. We have that actually the Department of Inspection is less funded. Inspection is not only related to infrastructure, number of teachers, but also quality of education. The inspectorate department will be clearing education. Secondly, we want to compromise the new secondary culture. There have been so many health guys, then the teachers, the learners, and also the seconders who are very interested in education. But actually, it is very hard to instruct learners in this new culture because most of the teachers were not well prepared. So, as the alternative, we will go to school systems in this coming financial year. As the alternative, we want to increase and improve in the environment. Schools and members. Now, we have so that we provide education to our members. We have to go to schools and we are coming up with a concept which we are going to find so that we can build up all our schools in this country. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sure the rest of uh, yes, you can give them a round of applause. The rest of the alternative uh, policies, uh, the statements from the shadow ministers will be played later on. Uh, but that was to help you get a, a feel, especially of the theme, the theme for this budget reading, which is rethinking Uganda's economy 
the human rights approach to resources allocation. Now, our main presentation for the day is coming up, but I'd like to invite the Shadow Minister for Finance, Planning and Economic Development, Honorable Mwanga Chivumbi, to kindly come and take us through the budget highlights. And thereafter, his highlights, we shall have the budget speech from the leader of the opposition in parliament. So let's give uh, Honorable Mwanga Chivumbi a round of applause. He might not have a briefcase, but I'm sure that what he has is adequate enough. Um, the president of the National Inter Platform, Honorable Robert Chagrin Sentani. Uh, the leader of opposition and my boss. I'm being very careful with the protocol. I'm not very used to protocol. And uh, I know the representative of JEMA, the representative of PPU. I don't know how Honorable Nyanju is representing the road. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, when I bring Nigeria, I could be a representative of the Lord I would go FDC. is the president of FDC. So uh, I'll come back. First of all, and honorable colleagues, I've seen the, I, the Inspector General of Government and quite the Secretary General of, of our party. I've seen my boss, the opposition chief whip. The protocol observed. I first of all turned on my apology. I came in late. I had the lecture to give you materiality uh, from eight to ten. And it's an international class. I always teach it twice a year. So I had to make that obligation. So I'm sorry for coming late. It's not my ways. Um, my work is simple. My work is to present the highlights of the budget. But before I do so, let me remind myself and the colleagues here. When I was running our trade in public service, Dr. Kawanga Semogere emphasized that we are always we must sharpen our, our five senses. For you to have a successful career in public life, in whatever endeavor you go to, you must have extras. You must have a sense of duty, a sense of responsibility, a sense of conviction, a sense of commitment, a sense of sacrifice, a sense of patriotism, and above all, a sense of courage. During my presentation, I will refer to each of these senses because whatever I'm going to present speaks volumes about them. The highlight of, um, I'm supposed to make a very brief presentation. The highlight of this budget, I'm required to really give the highlight of the resource envelope. And the entire budget speech will be by the leader of opposition. And I want to divide so much into those details. Now, when you look at, I don't know whether that graph is big enough. We have two budgets. We have um, the government's budget, and that's the one I will start with, which is a resource envelope. It has revenue projected to be 28 trillion point eight. They intend to, by law, you have to indicate whether you will get money from the petroleum fund. The government indicated they will get zero. Now, I want only that one. They intend to do a domestic borrowing. Well, they are going to borrow. Last year, they borrowed five trillion. This year, they are going to borrow 1.5 trillion. They are going to do external borrowing. External borrowing last year, with 6.7 trillion, the, this year they are going to borrow 8 trillion. 
that's the government's budget proposal from the budget framework paper because I've looked at this morning at the detail of the budget that they've laid, it has slightly changed. The figures are fairly different, slightly different. They are going to do a domestic refinancing, which is the debt rollover of last year, it was 8 trillion. This year, it is going to increase to 8.7 trillion. They are going to do local government, revenue for local government mobilization and this speaks volumes all our local governments are going to generate 208 and 38 million billion and 200 and it will be the same as this year now when you look at that budget the total amount of money will be 48 billion which they are going to collect but then they go down to reduce that budget because some are statutory obligations. They are going to do external debt repayment. That is the money they are going to use to pay for our external debt, which is called amortization. They are going to pay 2.4 trillion of that money. So you reduce the 48, the 49 now by 2.8, 2.4 which is uh, amortization. There's going to be project support, which is external financing. This money borrowed of 8 trillion will reduce it because government does not have that money. You also reduce debt rollover. I may explain a bit about debt rollover. Debt rollover is money that government borrowed out of our domestic market. Our domestic bank now stands at about 13 to 18 trillion. But that's that will mature this year. And ideally, we should have paid it back. If we had a sound economy, we would have, been, we would have paid back 8 trillion. But this government does not have that money. So what it instead does, it goes back to the market and burns and pays for that debt. And we pay interest on it. So that's what they call a big roll of it is matures. We should have paid it. We don't have the money. We go back. So you pay for me, you pay for me to pay one of the child and send them. And then you pay me interest. So idea we should have paid one of the child and sent him his own money, the president, but you don't have that money. So you go back and beg to pay it. So that money doesn't come at all to service delivery. So they are going to do. We have domestic areas and we have issues with domestic areas. Last year they paid 261 billion. This year they are going to pay 200 billion. They are going to pay, they call it appropriation in eight. These are revenues generated. It's, it's the same as up from local government. It's going to be 28, 238 billion. So what will remain there now from 39, you have gone to 30. So you have remained with 30 trillion. But still, you have to go back and pay interest on money payment. And interest on money payment is going to be 46 trillion of your money. It's going to pay just not debt, but interest of the money paid. They are going to pay six. So you minus it from 30. Then you are going to pay less domestic debt repayment to Bank of Uganda. This is a victory for our Office of the Leader of Opposition. We tried to encourage the government to declare the extent of its, its full indebtedness. They were refusing. And last year, we made the case that they had borrowed four trillion from Bank of Uganda, which they had refused to pay. And I will not force them to pay that money. They've been paying. Now they are declared it for the first time in the history of this country. They are going to be, they have declared 1.2 trillion. That's the result of our work. They were hiding it below the table. So what remains out of the uh, what they call this discretionary expenditure, money available for service for government to spend is 22 trillion out of 49. 
So the rest of your money, more than 50%, is going to be spent largely on pouring debt. That's the economy. However, that is half the story. We have made our own, because I want to go straight and be brief, we have made our own budget. But before I go to our own budget, the things they leave out and that's the social expenditure because we don't have to the country, the actual money available for service. So we have remembered this budget to reflect the full amount of what is near the discretionary expenditure. So can I have another slide? The one, uh, yes. Now, we have looked at this table of years and other people think they live out intentionally. I will not be sorry, I will not bore you with the whole thing I've already explained. I will not be reducing from 30. From 30, they reduced interest payment of 6.1 trillion. They reduced now for us, we have gone ahead and reduced pension because the pension cannot be the discretionary expenditure. Pension is good. Pension has a good So, what do you mean to pay pensioners? It's not for service, anybody. So, you cannot term it as part of the discretionary expenditure. So, we have reduced pension by pension is, uh, is 278. Gratuity cannot be. It's, Statutory obligation on behalf of government. So you have to go and reduce the gratuity. So I've reduced the gratuity 115 billion out of uh, from 30. We have reduced it. We have been around and reduced the first time wage. Because government has got to pay its workers. You can imagine that wage is also part of the dissectional envelope. Because you have know, to pay to other people work or to work, you've got to pay your workers. So don't say it's not money available for the executive to, to allocate as they wish. So you've got to, you've been ahead to remove the 6.9 trillion of wage. And you've got to remove it once for us. The constitution, the public finance management acts, my next government in, in section 77, that every financial year there should be a contingency fund. A contingency fund is 0 0.05 of the previous budget. This contingency fund will help us once it is fully provided for and also replenish every financial year. Uh, what I'm going to take. Okay, thank you. Um, I was on continuous fund. The law clearly says every financial year you should go out and um, and um, and replenish it. So you put a percentage of zero point zero five on forty eight trillion of last year, and you get that amount of money. The continuous fund provision will address the question of disaster, will address the necessity for supplementary, will address government has not been providing for that money. So we will go back and reduce those deductions. The actual money for the government is available for service delivery, for roads, for infrastructure, for doing water, for doing is only 15 trillion out of 49. And there is no intelligent fact that can persuade us to think that wage or gratuity or pension or contingency fund fund a part of the discretionary right funding. So we go ahead. So as the owner of Cassandra June first, he should acknowledge that's the true amount. That's the two. To tell you that they are in a very sad financial position than the country actually is. Now I'm going to give you a justification of our own budget. Can we have the slide? Now, for us, we've done our budget, and I'm going to justify every single coin on our table. Our revenue 
It's not going to be like a government. Our revenue is going to be at the two trillion. And I will justify where we are going to get the 32. We are going to get, first of all, projected that government consistently has been reporting a shortfall on URA collection of nearly 1 trillion. So we reduced the government's budget uh, projection of 48 for us to project that if all goes well, from URA, we shall collect from the 27. We take up for the one period short period that is consistently reported. But for us to be very callous, we are saying this government exempts tax exemption every single year for people who don't pay tax. 7.7 last year. We are paying to the government. Everyone must pay their dues. The rich must be paid. And I will get Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown is a former chancellor of exchequer of UK. This is what Gordon Brown said. Where is he? It's not wealthy. Unless that wealth helps more than the wealthy. If you are wealthy and you are only helping the wealthy, then that wealth is just a waste. He said, fortune. Fortune is not, is, should help more than the fortunate. And riches must not only enrich some of the community, but must enrich all the community. That's what Gordon Brown said. So it's even silly and natural cultural value for those that God has given so much to pay back to society as much. And I'm saying everyone must pay. That have people to legislate themselves out of the, the taxable bus. When you talk to a government, you will pay. Even if it's parliament, you will put it on your governments. Yes, you don't want to hear that. If I'm a minister of finance, there will be no law that will exempt any Ugandan from income tax. Because if this parliament paid, our taxes in a financial year will be 100 billion. So every constituency will have the 100 you need for the long term. And so are the leaders. Everyone will make his bill. The rich must pay. People want better roads, better everything. And you say you don't want to pay? You are doing good things. His salary is consolidated. The council pays the tax on allowance. You will set yourself out of, the, of what? Of payment bracket. That is it now. And as the finance minister in our government, and I will this person will some prisoners exempt themselves. Even I'm saying, the generals in this country, all the armed forces don't pay. We are saying the amount of the general are You can choose the general support soldiers of the army of Iraq, not to pay. But the amount of the colonel, captain, the generals, pay tax. We shall not buy new cars and we don't pay. So, so we shall be a little bit of um, tax revenue. So, we will get out of the seven and recover two. But also, these companies will exempt. How can you exempt like a roofing? I will give you an example of roofing. It has been here for ages. But it doesn't want to pay tax. It doesn't pay. I can go through companies that don't pay. Steel and tube don't pay. Every rich person in this country doesn't pay. Please, when you take over government, the rich are the people pay. Can you imagine the end? Can you imagine the The very small, become the biggest company to go coming from pay as you earn. Okay? But the person who is working from pay as you earn is the person who are going to be that back. The person who is going to be that 
for all parts. So let's call the one of us, please, for this Jews. And you know what? It's because you are being in the patronage. Tax exemption is the part of being in the patronage. And it's going to break that cartel of patronage by making them pay their fair dues. Let's prove that they are limited by the strength of their manifesto, their idea, not because they exhibit a cartel of rich people and feed us our people. That's why we are going to raise four trillion. We're going to raise another one trillion, but that's effective. We are collecting our tax to GDP efficiency collection is at 13%. The other is at 16%. If you only up the other a little bit, less corruption, less of tax, and even of these tax, you will get another one trillion by being less corrupt, by being more efficient. So we shall add it. That's how we shall generate the 30 on the donor funding, we will generate more donor confidence than a government that abuses human rights, that imprisons people, that has better democratic credentials, organized free and fair elections. The world will be willing to help you a little more. So we are telling government, instead of investing in the and these other things, just make your democratic credentials first. We raise more money. And we are saying we raise from two trillion, we, are, we shall raise the three, another thing, because we will be more democratic country. I don't think our president or any of the presidents seated here will be faltered on democratic credentials. That's why we must know democratic and the you hurt the economy. You are a proponent of liberty. So those people are saying you need a certain big, you know, you know, the powerful president, they hurt the economy. Now, it's kind of worrying because we want the more money. We will put our standard money as to what we have inherited. We shall not increase it. Because when you, you, it remains as is, the, even if you become a president today, they have to sign international obligations the country will have to meet. And it will be people that miss our international obligations. So we will stay with the external building as it was last year, but not increase it. Then on debt rollover, debt rollover, we are saying the moment because we are going to be making it to be a good player, to be a good player, you have collected the five more trillion more. So on that river, you go out there and honor our debt and begin to rebuild. Out of life, the end trillion, you can't rebuild it in one final year and not collapse an economy. But every year we shall rebuild two first, three in three years, we shall have no debt rollover. And you know the seven the with that, the interest payment on loans will go down to nearly two trillion, and they have three trillion to spend on service delivery. And they're saying one trillion in the trillion is a game changer. But you are not get an interest payment to five. After they're going to be six, so we will reduce that and uh, and and do the trillion. Of, and you know, so we shall keep the trillion of that six. Other than raising, and for me, and let me say this, why do this here? I believe you should investigate vote 130 and that debt rollover. I believe the bulk of it is a fixed year's expense. It's another way of abusing our finances the way they do in classified expenditure. And now, as, as I know, I have evidence, they are back on shadow contracts. So, most likely, that will provide to be some fake funding for patronage support. Um, the next one is local revenue. We don't harass Wanaichi. We will keep it as it is. As, as it is, we shall raise my money. But I have an issue with local revenue. I believe, and I've been questioning this, there are 
government funds who are paying billions of money in, in their support in the budget. We spend more money to support government agencies that should have given us revenue than the revenue we get. Every government agency that fails in the financial work on our watch to have, to have um, a black even. What we assess it. If we believe you are first, we shall prioritize you. If not, we will change the management. You can assess them. Um, now, we go to reducing. So our collection will be 48 billion. External debt, repayment, amortization, we will keep it as government has kept it because for last financial year, we don't have borrowed more. Um, external we will keep it to 6 trillion point seven. The number of our search, we will keep it to 6. And domestic areas. Let me speak about domestic areas. The domestic areas that government should pay to the people who have who have given provided more services to the economy, to the government, is 844. We will put it all in one financial year because that will streamline the economy. The people who pay are the indigenous. What happens? You are paying the foreigners, you are paying the Azul, the China, you are paying everybody, you are refusing to pay the local providers. They are big money in the local banks. That's why we have a lot of mortgages on the market. So, yes, and it is erroneous to be budgeting for supplemental and your accumulating areas. Because government is work, government is agencies and accounting officers are not supposed to create government where they don't have money. That's why for every unexpected expenditure, if you have money, you submit your supplemental. At the same time, you are supplementary spending and also accumulating uh, areas. It is erroneous. It is not in any school of economics. Then, so we per 100%. We also reduce. So our budget will come to 32. For us, we will go back and reduce interest payment at surge because we've, we've reduced. Our debt rollover, because we have not build more debt, we shall have only 3.3 trillion. Interest payment, please put it back. I... Interest payment. Uh, so we shall reduce interest payment, gratuity, debt um, wages as they are. And we shall have the discretionary expenditure of 20 trillion. Visa V government is 15. And we believe with that expenditure, when you have a resource envelope of 20 realistic trillion, other than the fixed, the, the 22 that is fixed years. So you run the two, you run uh, the, the two of ours and theirs and on, on the same sheet. And you see the difference. So you have more money for a budget, more money for government to spend, and more everything. So, honorable colleagues, our budget in social envelope will be that much. But let me say a few things here as I wind up. No amount, and that I should better be understood, no amount of economic engineering can fix an economy without a leadership with the financial discipline. Today, if I am the Minister of Finance, the Secretary to Treasury, with the same behavioral tendencies, I want to make even a scratch impact. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? We've spent 500, 527 billion on attack without any bag of sugar coming out of attack of taxpayers' money. 
We have spent 313 billion on the Chira Moto without the Chira Moto putting the even barrel in the street of Kampala. That is almost a trillion. We have spent a lot of money on banking something. It's if I invested that money in one first, like boost up the maize production, yes, I got to debate in parliament. It is crying for four billion to distribute each one penny of maize. Now, in the moment of people, they have 10,000 pounds. Now, if you give me one ton of this, that is one thousand kilograms. That means in home, I will give it 10 grams of seeds of rice to fight to for the sustenance for the food security of the system. How do you do? I will tell you to find a person who is in the world to look to fight the hunger as severe with the there are so many things that you can do, and I can basically that will impact on the so as a level of the street. It needs to be made clear. One, for as long as you operate your economy on service and not on liquidity as a paradigm, you will not go very far. Service is economic union. You know economic union. Economy, these people who are like you want to pay back, they say, please reduce your debts to be immediately debt ratio. In terms of GDP to be to be ratio, it's because for them they will say you borrow and you're going to generate income. But today, in here, every unbankable idea in this country, unbankable project. The last one of the last result, actually, the only first result is the government of Uganda. Now, somebody wants to come here and go to a pharmaceutical company. The caucus is called the caucuses of volunteer persons, of the various caucuses under the United to come here and push a supplemental of 600 billion to give it to somebody. He was almost imprisoned in India. Yes, some people should leave us for for given evening. We are not a country of fools. No, you cannot spend that much money on security. Yes, I looked at the numbers of money for soldiers. They got a supplemental of ninety for some security uh, increment and three hundred and thirty nine billion to increase wage on. These so called uh, uh, crime preventers. Now, the people waiting for you to be going to be near 800. Can you sustain with the country at peace without war, without anything? Can you sustain that? So, why don't you invest in diplomacy? Stop the general mongering. Stop all these endeavors. Entire the democratic governance in all these countries it is cheaper. I will not keep up the presentation of the budget speech. I beg to rest my case. Yes, I, I think uh, Honorable Chivumbi deserves a better round of applause than that. Well, I, I can tell you I was surprised that uh, the small folder can have so much information. It is, but, but I will keep my reservations on that one. Our distinguished guests, before we have uh, the budget speech presented to us, let us just have two more uh, statements from the shadow ministers. This will allow for everybody to internalize what uh, the Minister for Finance has proposed in his uh, in the highlights, and thereafter the lead of the opposition will come and, and drop it up properly. So let's have uh, just two more presentations from the shadow ministers. Thank you.
This is Kaya Christine Nashimoero. She was the district member of parliament and also the alternative minister for water and environment. As an alternative government, we feel that we should concentrate on the following issues. One, we need to renovate, rehabilitate the already dilapidated ecosystems, especially forests. And then we have to evict all encroachers. We must regularize the surveys and boundary locations such that the residents are aware. Those who have ever acquired the titles within these forest reserves and wetlands have to be evicted immediately. We are also looking at um, revamping the financing of climate change management options. There are a lot of finances out there, but we're just looking on with our national budget can no longer sustain the actions we feel uh, can build the resilience of our people. We are also uh, looking at um, uh, strengthening the meteorological services in Uganda because weather forecasts are very important to help our people decide the kind of activities that they can take part in. And the different sectors must be cognizant of the weather forecasts, how to build roads, how to construct houses. All this must, uh, incur, must be cognizant of the forecasts such that we have resilient constructions in roads, in, in uh, housing, and also agriculture. What is best for this place in this period is very important for us as we try to reduce poverty among the star population. Here are some of the salient uh, actions that we feel should take us in this coming financial year. I thank you. Uh, my name is Kabir Frank, the Shadow Minister for the Youth and Children Affairs, the MP for Cassandra South Constituency. Since the youth and the children cause the largest population in Uganda, we have a lot of issues that are affecting us and this cut across. And we are looking at the problem of the teenage pregnancies and child marriage. This is affecting our communities and it has been a high and interest during the lockdowns we had due to the pandemic. And we are coming up with alternatives to scale these young girls so that they can impact the communities where they, where they, where they live. You see that those that can uh, attain or go back to school to qualify to be uh, absorbed and are able to go to the schools so that they can also attain a future in education. And this we are willing to be and push until we achieve the desired goal. You see that everyone that this qualifies with a skill and the knowledge to learn and contribute to the community. We are impacting on our youths that are measures that are going to ensure that the children and the young ones have, uh, they have assurance for better life by looking into the health sector, looking at how government, uh, how in our government we can uh, reduce the taxes on the things that are needed by others. For example, the markets which are almost to everyone, and now we are making uh, childbearing look like a business or a burden. So we have to use that and we look at it as a treasure because we are building for the nation. We are going to introduce the 10% inclusion for fresh graduates in every office or in every sector to see that at least they get that chance to be experienced, to, to reduce on the, the, the because some of these people have total lack of experience and the very skills that are being put are not for the law and not at the uh, observing the available number of groups who have been able to, uh, to reach out to the community and the market. So you need to do that and we shall put them because everyone who gives you a hand to do that and to give us a great hand to come and do things because every idea is in the fight to see that we have a better country and a better generation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was partly a commercial break, but also giving you time to digest the highlights uh, from the budget speech. Our uh, distinguished guests, I know there are so many of you, some of you were not recognized earlier. Allow me to just uh, recognize just a, a few of you. I'll continue recognizing even as uh, the day goes on. And this is in no particular order. Uh, Mr. Kamadi Bionabie, uh, Chairperson, Human Rights uh, Commission, were you? Okay, Mr. Huntington Musimenta from the NPA. Thank you for joining us. Of course, uh, the Honorable Betty Kamia is here with us. 
Rajab Semakulat, LC5, Kalangala. I believe you're here with us. Yes, thank you. You're most welcome. Uh, Mr. Moses Egunyu from IRI. Thank you very much. And all the civil society who are here. Uh, Mayor Bakite from Nansana. I think Nansana is well represented. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Nanyonga from Chira Municipality. Yes, you're most welcome. Uh, Speaker Mawanda Alan from Mukono Central. Yes, thank you. You're most welcome. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel Selinjoji, Mayor Kawempe. Thank you. You're most welcome. Uh, Mr. Martin Luanga Buanika, Chair Wakiso. Yes, you're most uh, welcome. Mr. Jeff Wadulo, CS Bug. Yes, I will continue recognizing uh, the, the guests, uh, but all of you are really most welcome. And we thank you that you have found the time to come and listen. Now, our highlight for the day is, of course, the presentation of uh, the budget speech by the leader of the opposition. So it gives me a great honor and a pleasure to invite our leader of the opposition, Honorable Mathias Sempuga, to kindly come and deliver your alternative budget speech. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the work done by uh, Peter, Mr. Peter Odeke, in uh, recognizing uh, our various guests. But allow me, in a special way, to receive my the President, the Honorable Chagot Senghu, welcome to Parliament. The different leaders here. I told him I will do it next time, and will be next time. Well, it's in the in the palm. Of my friend, the British Labour Man, representing the Blue Corner, Mr. Saddam Gaga. And I get a letter from the members of parliament, friends, gentlemen, Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Honorable Manachimundi, has ably enumerated our sense of the resource envelope. And I have nothing beautiful to add. So for uh, a little bit of elaborating on why our intentions and what they are. So for the next few minutes, I'll try to repurpose that resource envelope. The questions have been coming through uh, why this assembly, why this budgeted for the opposition. Of course, the opposition is evolving. And the opposition is in the permanent position. And where we walk, where we sleep, where we spend our days, the horizon shows us different signs. And I sense that you are the signs of the times. When a government does not know what it has in the pocket, you know that government is in, in the corridors moving out. And the economic model observe, they don't even know how much money they have to spend. It's our duty to focus the nation to what is going to happen after. Inevitably, the regime will pack up and go. But so I do to express our readiness to lead. So, Mr. President, my impressions I'm going to share with you this morning are impressions of a group ready to lead, not just in case. 
We are just saying, please give us a chance. We are actually ready. The whole majority of the is the Libra president of NLP in charge of the Sun Uganda. She was not recognized. You are most welcome. The very senior citizen. And the array of our invitations was intentionally to draw the attention of the nation to our work and why we believe the country is missing us. At the end of the day today, you're gonna be wrong what they are missing. You probably don't know what they are missing. And uh, I want to thank you, Mr. President, for the team that gave me work with in Parliament, my chief whip, the shadow ministers, and the reflection here uh, a collective effort of this team. We took our time, our schedules, and through these ideas, and we collectively put together from the different political fields. They were simply the ones they came of NUP, let our these leaders. They are oppression from different terms of opinion. We come back to all them, and we thought we can make and uh, as the moderator informed this meeting that uh, the theme of our budget is uh, the thinking, the government budget and the uh, initial approach to budget and social location. We are aware that over the last few years, Government will go through the sector approach to what they call the program approach to budgeting. I want you to unleash any government minister in the Cold War Parliament to come and move them and watch my approach about the budget approach to budgeting, the program approach to budgeting. They will end up in the room, I'm very sure. So, when we are in the Saturday, Government occupying space, those one of the will tell you the interaction with ministers and able to explain what they are doing that they are pretending over government. The migration from the sector approach to program approach was never properly conceptualized. Eventually, I'll say, I put a tiger in a quick translation into action. That's why they will tell you that we are not paid salary, but the budget is for salary. We are going to the pay for science teachers. But if you are a lady teacher and you are a science lady teacher, you are not in college, you are a lady teacher, but not a teacher. Oh gosh. Then you ask what happened to the problem function of government? So, what we are going to do is we are sampling to the afternoon slowly. We want to share with the world, the switching guests, our impressions of where we are and where we want to go. And because the shadow minister has uh, enabled me to shed a light on the key impressions, I will work very fast. I'll ask uh, the gentleman, the projector, uh, to begin the projections, yeah, right where they are. I explained earlier on that the objective for uh, a human rights based approach to budgeting is because there's a reason why citizens demand for a government. A government is not just an impression, a government must be one for a purpose, and the entire scope of reason for having government is enshrined in the band of rights that we must, as of necessity and as of right, our birthright enjoy. Chapter four of our constitution clearly underscores the extent of rights. And if you look at this huge booklet here that enshrines our ideas, we have bundled these programs, these ideas into four. Initially, 
civic and political rights, and the entities therein are well structured, then economic rights, and then lastly, social and cultural rights. We don't have 20 programs, we have nothing. We have that three bundle of rights, civic and political, economic, then social cultural rights. We believe if we underscore and resource those bundles of rights will be home and dry. The reason why governments are governments is because they are sensitive to the needs of their people. And all the services governments provide are done so as a matter of right. And governments must ensure that the obligation to availability of resources, accessibility to resources in their adequate quantities, and reducing the extent of inequalities by passing resources, reduce inequities and inequalities. And of course, that all that they do in terms of programming is done to ensure that human rights are observed. Basically, the right to education, the right to safe water, the right to health, the right to a job, these are not actually dominated by government. They are a matter of right. And therefore, our budget programming is meant to deliver that. Can we continue? So, in doing this, like the Shadow Minister for Finance observed, the government must be transparent. The government must enhance participation of citizenry. The government must be accountable and must not discriminate. Have you had government ministers telling citizens that you have to run and benefit from service, government services? And they claim to be a government. That must be a cobble, not a government. Continue. So we, we believe that once you observe these rights and you know that citizens make us leaders to observe those rights, then you are able to deliver. Let me give you in the next five minutes where we are in terms of the economic outlook. The first is about inflation and domestic prices. We know for a fact that inflation in Uganda is double digit for the last more than three years. And the double digit inflation is partly because we are unable to fathom how to deal with it. This room bears a number of economists. And uh, one of the shocks in Uganda is that the government is trying to deal with inflation. But they are moving somebody in the country which type of inflation they are dealing with. We contend that the country is facing structural inflation. And if you are facing structural inflation, you do not invoke the kind of practices the government invoked to deal with it, namely a compactionally monetary policy that is reducing money in situation. But it too, an expansion of fiscal policy, meaning collecting more money from the public. But people are broke. The kind of inflation we are facing is what we call the little money in people's hands chasing to for goods. That's the economics. That's the, the, the first subtopic in inflation. So you are facing structural inflation, you are defining. The complexion of fiscal peace and in policy, meaning that you do not have a lot of money in their pockets. We are actually a block. So eventually, we are failing to deal this inflation. And to make this money for more than 24 months, we contend that the biocuba inflation is imported because we are meeting importers of petroleum products. And the petroleum import bill is the biggest. The second is the steel. Importing down and um, iron and steel. Continue down. So, we must deal with this inflation holistically. One, by enhancing production, because structural inflation includes production. We must deal with those issues that impair 
and disable production in the economy, it's not because people have a lot of money in their pockets. Later, the are interest rates. Because you have inflation, interest rates, as we may say, are high in our banks. Commercial banks engage inflation by hiking interest rates. So what do you do? Because now you are facing structural inflation, and interest rates are very high, the producers are disabled from borrowing. So you continue in a situation of in a digital produce, in a digital produce to, to social loans. So you end up with inflation and unemployment, which the economy is caused by the inflation. That's where we are. So in every bank, commercial banks will look at the rate of inflation and will determine the rates charged on loans, so a better economic situation. Continue down. Can you move? Look at our external account. We are in 284 million dollars in terms of BOP described here with Asia. Asia is our biggest partner, Asian Saudi, China, India. They account for this. So between what we sell there and what we get there, that's the deficit of the BOP account. Continue. The Middle East. One zero six million dollars between what we sell and what we get. That's the deficit, and of course the rest of the world could be done first. So what is that is strange with the BOP account? Now when you are facing a BOP disagreed BR, you don't need the approach being economics tomorrow. That you must distinguish between the term problems that require. I mean, I mean, things you are able to export. What do you do? You get two things on your BOP account and you export more. If you are facing the long term disequilibria, no reforms. So we never have reforms, no adjustments. So the BOP account over the next 12 months is going to remain in that big picture. We have a problem in Kenya. Over the last two days in Parliament, the government has been struggling to explain how to approach it. We are asking them, so if Kenya builds up, what is the remedy for Uganda? They are saying they are in charge. I think they are in charge of Uganda and Kenya. Now, if you have a crisis, our external reserves can only hold us for 3.6 months. A basic economy requires at least six months of input capacity in a crisis. We can only survive for three and a half months in our situation. That's why economy. Scroll down. So we have talked about that, continue down, the major cause of the BOP account is Scribria, and our solution going forward, if we're a government, of course, we have a lot of resources, ability resources. One of them is iron ore that we have for the first time in Uganda. I know the government banned the export of iron ore, but I'm also aware that some people, some, some small ones are exporting slowly the raw material. The iron ore in in Uganda is capable of sustaining not only East Africa, but the rest of East and Central Africa that are importing from China. You have a thing that part of the imported bill of iron ore fuel and aluminum products by exporting the iron oil in Western Uganda. There's so much money we have spent trying to exploit oil. If I put that in, put that in, that would be miles ahead. I don't think our plan are here. I don't sleep. I'm, I am aware somebody from NPA is here. I'm also aware of people at NPA are doing their best. But in the economy, we talk about planning without the plans. And the plan is not planning. Which of these two days are implementing? Continue. We also do a course 
most of you probably run in a way you know, interact with the dollar. That is the extent of our exchange rates. And the reason is very simple. If you are not you are not importer, you are not exporting, that gets us back up in the exchange rate. Secondly, you have broken leverage in terms of capital flight. You have a broken balance. Capital flight, that's where you are in terms of the exchange rate. So I, if you are not competing in terms of the exports, so eventually, over the last couple months, the shilling has been impacted by 3.1% and the city depreciating. Continue. The fiscal deficit, I thought the, the short of the talk about the for companies the need for benefit. That's the difference between what you locally mobilize and what you intend in yours locally. We're talking about local mobilization. Our fiscal deficit is at 5.4%. And the reasons have been able to them because, you know, it's that big because we exempt people from paying taxes, instantly, the corruption that is endemic, and of course, the inefficiencies in local revenue mobilization coupled with budget abuse, like the Shadow Minister has reported. When you have those abuses, this is going to end up with a huge physical deficit. That's where we are. Continue down, and our solutions for this. Um, can you go to the solutions for the physical deficit? Uh, okay, you, you go back a bit up by two steps. We call the public debt again. Yeah, of course, the, the solution is for the fiscal deficit, like I mentioned, the shadow credits are able enumerated of our entire corruption approach to revenue mobilization and tax exemptions that we consider illicit, and of course, enhancing the domestic revenue mobilization as a solution. Budget abuse in this country, if you're a member of parliament and you are not figured out how the budget is abused in, in your own place. And it's abused because partly our oversight is weak. And of course, I'm not bearing the reading party in parliament, making it very improbable to move as a parliament to exert enough pressure on the regime to be misplaced. And certainly, it's the DNA of the, the sitting government to abuse public funds. How do you answer to DNA? I'm not a scientist. Probably I'll ask Dr. Batwa if they can change one DNA. But the question of DNA is permanent. You can only, eh? yeah, the good doctor from Congo says it's a, it's a crimson. So I don't know how to change the DNA from this government to this origin. Let's move down. We have talked about the public debt. I don't want to waste time on it. The finance minister has talked about it. Move down. What you should know about the public debt, I have enjoyed. The only 100 shillings, you are a collect. 100 shillings, you are a collect. And the 70 shillings go to public debt servicing. Every 100, 37 is on debt. We have no idea to come. I don't know how to do it. That's how dire our situation is. That is 37%. So the public debt exerts 37% pressure on every inch of local revenue mobilized. That's how dire. Let's move a bit faster. The trend lines of the debt, I don't have to go over them. The causes have been enumerated. Move down. Of course, the solutions we in our six months early government want to cause an audit into all forms of borrowing. Some borrowing is illicit, some borrowing is fictitious, some borrowing is not declared. So let's audit you borrow for that. We can find and some of the borrowing is unthreatened. You are aware, I remember in the floor parliament several times to question. A new mechanism called the pre financing or financing especially public roads infrastructure. So the government meets with uh, 
a compactor, a Chinese or Indian or whatever, and say, I want you to go and construct a camper, a massacre camper, a UA. Name your price. That building is not built to parliament, but it's a form of government. Without parliamentary approval, which is unconstitutional and illegal, and initial. So we need to own some of this building. Remember, bad contracts sometimes are 10 times overpriced. That's why they need to be audited. And I want to, 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 to encourage my sister, the IDG, to just yourself in a financing contract, compare them with other forms of contracts to better understand how this taxpayer is being fleeced in this country. The financing contracts. Of course, the finance minister has talked about rolling back on domestic borrowing, which is a huge problem that clouds out uh, domestic uh, investments. We, we talked about that already. Move down. The banking sector in that book is very enumerated. It's foreign dominated. Because the banking sector is recorded by foreign owned banks, capital flow is 100%. At the end of the day, the local banks are being spread out of business. And part of the reason and part of the solution, Bank of Uganda has by law mandated to banning the minimum capital coming from the bank. And apparently now, at Australia, 25 billion people can open a bank. That's why I encourage you to go into circles, median, and the like. One of our solutions is to make sure people with the law to at least reduce, create two private systems for locally owned bank and the business. We do that can help local people to ease on the restrictive capital requirements for starting local banks. I wrote to the servants and then say that it was a mistake to sell UCB. Was UCB sold? But he just shared. For those troubles, we would have our own government or the commercial bank. And for the purpose of enabling local people to access credit from their own. Our neighbors in Kenya have, I think, four banks here. All we have in other countries, so we export trouble to other countries, not business. I've only had Central Bank starting a bank in Malawi, we wish them luck. We shall have export bank out for the region. Trouble. We shall start a government owned bank, government bank. All governments have banks. Now, um, Corruption. Just close to it as I, 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 I talk about corruption. I think corruption in this country can cause you nausea. And I think those who write about it have run out of pages. If you have the book, which you have written into the, the, the side of your book or in the cover, the cases are innumerable. Move down a bit. In 2021, that's how much we lost in corruption. 10 trillion. The forms of corruption are already included in this huge booklet. You read them. Move a bit down. And the way money is softened and the declaration of taxes. And education, which will take user fees, absenteeism from work, inverted payroll, ghost service consumers, like ghost students and teachers, and also have no ghost health workers. Yeah. Last year, what did the money for every center that does not exist? Remember, you just imagine every center given money and does not exist. So, corruption has no between the senses. Well, I'll be to come here. 
I'm going to say your goose is cooked. What's the outlook? You are aware, I'm sure, of this information that GTI carried out a study in 2021 and declared a 15.1 trillion lost in non recognition. And those are some of the cases salaries, virtual resources, payroll corruption, judicial corruption, procurement corruption, security, education. You see, we are the education minister in the parliament, and what you get is that she's very busy planning for the country. But see corruption in our ministry. Not in the parliament, not looking for the corrupt. So what's happening? That's the array. Move down. So we, the cost of the taxpayer, of course, in terms of the budget, in terms of the cost of service that would have gotten to the taxpayer, and of course the indirect costs. When people look weary about so many things and they give up on government and they give up on leadership, it's partly because they're exhausted of uh, complaining about corruption. That's very dangerous. It's our duty as leaders to motivate people not to give up on the government. That's it. I don't think we need to go over one by one some of the key corruption scandals from 1985 to 2012, but go on the go down because I believe that's where it started from. Yes, there in 1985, some people robbed the currency center of one million, and that was the beginning of the corruption we see. Yes. So 1985, a bank was robbed, and the robbers eventually declared themselves who they were, and they are all opposing the leaders. Then you wonder why we are where we are in terms of corruption. They were arrested, they are given out to offsprings, and they have been able to the same. The DNA of 1985 is what we are carrying through in terms of corruption. So, unless they receive, they will do away with corruption in this country. Put him down. Of course, the solutions, all of it come here, share with us. We shall cause a national reparation commission. And this commission, it will be a kind of amnesty. Have been in a thousand question scandal. Please report this office and return to the taxpayer. We are given six months to return. The corrupt must be unnamed than the known. Open the reports. I give these reports. We shall give them amnesty. Just like our government's commission for robberies and other people. So, how is it for the corrupt? Six months. Come and return to the taxpayer or you get you prosecuted. Secondly, e government. Resident eminently in procurement. People in local government and other places know how procurement is a permanent resident of the corrupt. So when you start e government, it's a big solution. It's more transparent. It's one way. But uh, when you go down, Scrutinize our sector of ICT. ICT is expensive and inaccessible. So you must be able to do so you should be able to handle corruption using e government. Of course, we like the mandatory lifestyle audit, over which the owner of it can be putting up trucks. I want to do it. Don't give up, please. Mandatory audit. Yes. One of my friends did ask me and tell him that, you know, I think our children one day ask her to uh, when people are building their kids and come back to their places. Because you are missing. All we carry with that are our suits and our integrity. That should be the request. We don't know what we don't want to do and they don't say. Even the children don't know what they do. I know a bunch of in space. 
I'm dealing with because they are they are rich. If you tell me you are rich, you answer two questions. How much do you have? How much do you have? Do you have two things? So, Madam I believe that's the job. We also intend to reduce performance based contracts because sometimes in most challenges, because people believe they are eternal. If you're not performing, you sign out. It's one of the reasons people to work and terminate people who are inept and unable to perform. Pastor, I want to go to the beef. Now, for my budget strategy, well, I'll give you an outlook of where we are and don't get frustrated. That's what we are, that's where we are. Thankfully, we are alive and have better ideas that we believe can uplift the citizenry in the frustration to thinking that this country can be resolved through. Our belief is that uh, the kind of planning is problematic, it's lacking in imagination, discriminatory, and unable to solve them, the needs of our people, and therefore the same sort of misdirection and the, the desire to help us, national resources. Our budget takes a human approach, like I said, and we did a three sum cluster civil and political rights, economic rights, and social and cultural rights. Move down. That's an array of sectors. Our fiscal framework, we have already laid down by the Ministry of Finance. I don't want to go. Built. The fiscal framework already done that was well laid down. Our process center was properly laid down. Yeah, let's go to, yeah, to the sectors. Yes, finance and planning. is got done with high levels of uh, inflation at 10.4% and rising. They are the showing. In due course, deal with the interest rates that are serious and, and deal with uh, a discriminator on our BVP account. That's our open date. I, I think the minister talked about it. Move down. And our two papers that the chance of the check I would look at is to reduce and avoid. Submission sub budgets and budget cuts. Reduce expedient based military expenditure. We really believe that uh, our expenditure on the military is partly expedient and not necessary. We're just being adventurous. What are we doing in Central Africa when our people are dying in Kalamudia? That's blind expenditure and expending so much money. Reduce government revenue loss, raise more uh, tax revenue. We intend to amend Rule 199, 159 to allow switching of tax laws, to borrowing, and of course, like the minister advised, the first quarter of 50% or even below, as our party, the more partners in their internet, do advise. Get down. Now let's go to the other economic sectors. A culture employing more than 70% of the population. Let's move. The structure of agriculture, as we know it, is standard growth, stagnated. It's not contributing to GDP they could have desired because of its nature and structure. It's more that farmers are out of the mouth. You know, it's affecting the cost of mouth, and of course, all the interaction of the resources and dependence on nature. In other words, what is our what are our priorities? Increase access to affordable agricultural credit. Curb the fiscal climate change through immigration. Somebody talked about the PDM, which died a stillbirth. If you read our big book, 
We intend to squat it immediately. It's not sense. Squat it, put that one into irrigation and support farmers throughout there. If you went to Masaka, for example, and made an invention with your farmers, they'll actually tell you their problem. They'll tell you, give us water. In another area, they'll tell you, give us the roads. So the PDM is one size fits all. Okay, that doesn't matter. Like the famous, you put your food forms. But they were very small, like it should be uniforms. So the people still bad. So we said we would scrap it and then pop at that resource into irrigation. Increase access to farm inputs and this is control. Of course, in the component of the inputs, in the document, you will see one of the activities, one of the steps is what Dr. Bedwanika has already done. His bill, I think, is uh, out for printing. The the, the farming compact bill. It is the most work we need to do in making sure that farmers access inputs of quality. That there is different level of supply inputs. Just imagine a farmer going to a shop, buy seed they never germinate, and it ends that way. So we are not doing it. We are we have a lot of in the earth. And we believe that by the end of this section of parliament, the famous Dr. Abed one country will see the right of day as part of our positive steps into the direction. The rest are beyond them, and we know them. Um, move down a bit. And of course, in doing that, we have allocated that much. That is in trillion, not billion, but the the, the computer man prefers to say 1488 which is 1 1.4, which 1.4 trillion. Move down. Education and sports. This is a situation. Retention. Low staff levels. Low competition of grant. I am aware that our competition grant in primary education and secondary is the lowest in the region, with the regional laggards that far. And we are proud of the dropouts. Hey, just get a bit up. You saw last year how many children had enrolled in primary one and how many completed. Primary seven, less than 40%, over 60% dropped out. What happened? No staffing levels. We have been investigating the main Ministry of Education, a number of schools around Kampala. A single class with 400 pupils and three teachers. Uh, my speaker for Kampala, you need to be interested. A school, a civil class with 400 pupils and three teachers, and you have a Ministry of Education and a Department of Education. So there are many issues we must say, deal with if they're going to really be serious and be relevant to the people. Proceed down. So what we intend to do is to restore the complete inspection in our claims, a school inspector, well, as good as a minister. What happened? We have been bad about the drunkards and we give support as a medical inspectors to go and pick money from the school teachers. You pick a school book out and make a new school inspector because the school is going for you at the station. So a government training, repurposing, and enumeration for inspectorate. Then the out of the issues of dropouts, the issue of non to our pupils in, in school and students in school. The secondary level curriculum, curriculum. The 31st of March, 2023, the 33 students have not yet gotten 
first time to a material. Let's speak. Question is, are they going to extend the time? Are they going to make a refund of the Are they going to be the pupils studying the whole day or at the end? They want to study materials. And you have a government and a government minister getting your salary. And also, I talked about particular welfare, the teacher of the most abused civil servants. They are abused. So, we are. There's no education system anywhere other than the university teachers. You have a number of teachers, you have a communication. We well, do good the belief that trans teachers must be motivated at the extent of us teachers. I have a question to one of the general factors, whether it's an art or a science. Is it an art? Is it? Is it an art or a science? No. Are you aware that, uh, for example, if I said that theorem comes from music? I know of that. In the boundaries are in mathematics. The composers of the same my initial musicians. So you are a science teacher, the art teacher should go and suffer, go and hang. Our policy is dual motivation, which shall motivate all the teachers. So we know that when we bring the day. The science teachers in government schools. So, what happens to science teachers in government schools? So, how do the private schools get more to watch government pay? So, they should go and hang. Our point is because some teachers are rare and few, our government will be safe in science teachers in government schools. Because all science teachers are available. Schools, because you have schools, common sense. You don't have to have a PhD in common sense to know that public teachers will afford the cost of private public schools will afford the cost of science teachers and that rate. So, how do we work with resources for education to recruit any mass available science teachers and send them to private schools? You, you can do this. It's done elsewhere. We are not about the school funding program. So we, have set, we are proud to send thousands of children to school to start the whole day. As far as we have all of these things, and all of these immigrants to go and see all that is demanding for some little money for food for children. Because we want to be honest, we will repurpose resources to make sure our children are fed at school. This country is not devoid of enough food. It's abusing resources and abusing people. The only minister for sports uh, made a very well presentation on sports, the only Kayemba, about our impressions on sports. Sports is not entertaining per se. Sports in our time is big time business. How much money has been spent on sports infrastructure over the last 10 years? A big zero. So we don't have resources devoted for sports in all regions because it's a big business. In our country, 75% of young people you do really encourage to go into sports as a business, as an investment, but they don't have sports facilities. In Kampala, school sports facilities were sold to thieves in Kampala. You know, so what do you do? Of course, as part of our recovery of government assets, we will recover all those assets. If you put there an arcade around the school, that arcade will become a program in the government. Make a mistake as part of recovering the country and stopping the nonsense that have been visible in this country for many years.
Okay. So we want to vote that much, make sure we purpose that much, recover the education sector. Move down gender, labor, and social development. The cause of our labor our workforce is low productivity, their rights are abused, they are less motivated. We have, uh, do you know that in this country, graduate unemployment is at 85%, 85% graduate unemployment, that's for World Cup. Inadequate management, insufficient coverage of social protection, move down. That's the structural analysis. Of course, we've been dealing with a huge problem of externalization. And because this market of legalization is now occupied by a mafia clique who would legislate it, the most poor, like other nations are doing, we will restructure it, regulate it, and the purpose is functioning. The Minister for Youth talked about youth friendly interventions in the communities. Our youth are sensitive, our youth needs to be understood, our youth needs to be redirected. Their efforts and their energy needs to be recalculated. And that's why we need more to deal with the challenges because they are unique. And uh, we find to them in who is good for the world for our country. Of course, you need to have your remand homes. Why are the children coming from Karamoja, taking the country in Isa, or any other place? Why not in an environment over their culture so that they can really grow as children? The arts industry is a huge industry. We need to revamp it. And that line, the one of the here at HDI, Dr. Hildenman, is leading us in uh, reviewing the, uh, the, the law that relates to this industry. The complete and never invites law is under review, cut us of his effort, won't thank him. And the part of the reason is to repurpose that law that it can serve so many young people, so many people are really talented that they can benefit from their talent. Move down, the rest by me and then. That's the, no, that's um, the zero is supposed to be inside 660 billion, not 66. Uh, you, you have to uh, 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 change that. You cannot do it outside with 66 billion. It's 660 billion. Move down to the next sector. Health. Dr. Bapua is a very, very uh, imaginative Minister of Health. His sector is as unlined, significantly underfunded. We have a resurgence of malaria in our communities. Rodic energy is eating away into its resource. Energy pregnancies are becoming a mainstay. We need to change all of this. One of the main issues in this booklet is how we deal with malaria. If we, if we lose two people, because of Ebola, in one week we close the country. But we lose more than 50 people every day of malaria. But you are happy to return home without a clear place to eradicate malaria. So we have elaborated clearly how we need to deal with this by repurposing the resources into more sophisticated spraying. It's been done elsewhere. If you had, if you go with my Minister of Health, tell me to explain that. You will go really at appreciating that we needed to, we, we can actually go out with malaria in this country. The each one is we're not motivated to do that. We can do it. Human resource. Are you aware, comrades, that uh, in this country, not even a half of the available medical doctors are employed by government? Not even a half, probably a quarter are employed. This country has about 5,000 trade medical doctors, only 1,300 are employed by government. So, 
And the point of the first recording of the plans is that we will also secure the facilities like uh, the um, uh, religious based in time and of it. Because we have more time to think than government of the centers. And that our point of self-sanitary will be the health center for. And the one of the last financial gave us the figures of how much money we will need to have a health center for in every constituency. And that money is very small, just 300 million. You will have at least a work of health center for in every constituency. Where the money is somewhere in expediency. So when we the grow of recruitment, we are working uh, with workers in this country that we should be motivated to stay here. They are running away because of lack of motivation. It's our job as a government government to put them in particular to return and open up as national resources. Scroll down. So we would have allocated 2.9 per period per sector. We are finally in some one of signing declarations. Maybe because you have a company that makes pens in Uganda. So every declaration we sign, we just sign, no matter. So we are seeking to be a bigger declaration that requires us to at least commit 15% of the national budget on health. The last time I checked, we are below eight. And regionally, we also a regional hug, I mean, uh, laggard in terms of in resources and health. Our our location will give us a percent of the budget. And if you give us five years in the government, we will pay to the 15% of commitment as, the, uh, as per their budget declaration. Move down. So after 40 years of the NRM government, we are still below 8%. And be sure if you give them another year, we will go about 5%. Because they are not doing any better worsening every day. Land and housing. My shadow minister of lands, I think, uh, is taking a journey, lost a family member when see around. But he has very interesting suggestions in this area. Due to the land problem. We have heard about land grabbing and evictions. Land is not simply an economic issue, it is a political issue for control of citizens. That's why people that are grabbing people's land are armed. They're not ordinary people. They are not really passing. When an ambition cannot go to the ritual and evict people from their land, it will become the part of the government because they don't control citizens. So land is a, a serious political matter. We will deal with it. The stretch of land grabbing, encroachment on public land. Those of you who have land not so well how much encroachment, illegal encroachment has been visited on public land. Of course, fraud and corruption and unorganized urbanization. That's why you're going to find somebody building in a road reserve. But they have their plans approved. So, the government in the very day, you will have to with the problem. Our priorities is to the land in your situation. But it's the land fund. It's one of the many options on our side, even now, is auditing the land fund. Remember, the land fund was meant to benefit the, the poor. That are on other people, but want to be as secure as this situation of tenure. But we are aware that part of the land fund was used by the smart people to buy plots in Kololo. So, how do you go to the land fund to go and buy a plot in Imokoto? So, this information is available. Probably, the ID should also interest herself in the land fund and how it's been utilized over the years. That people can actually afford to buy land. Went for the land fund to acquire land on Kampala Road and other places because there are other places. Not in the Bunyoro, not in the where people actually need this money. Not in the Bugada where people are being evicted from the Rabi and they cannot really buy for themselves. 
According to public land transactions, yes, public land transactions, people have really partaken of public land. My, my sister Santa now brought up into public farms in the north, in actually, that are being put out by the smart people, smart in quotes. Of course, review and implement the National Physical Development Plan. How do you address a housing deficit in this country? If you're a government, you can have an elaborate plan. What do you do to the Chibu slums? What do you do to the slums in Namuango? What do you do to the slums in all these places? In Kamocha? But you know, I have been in the surface, but I'm in the province place. There are so many people, you know. But what does the government can do with this problem? It's more housing for citizens, and they still have enough housing for government if you're a serious government. Continue. So we we'll vote, we we'll vamp that sector that much. Proceed. Tourism. Yeah, this is the situation in tourism. The situation is low tourist turn up, a low ranking, low quality, yet expensive accommodation, poor infrastructure, poor marketing. I heard some of the complaints that you see our gorillas are being fed uh, with the bananas from Rwanda, they are taking the so must we forgive you? Should 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 we you know, how do you justify tourism in an environmental pension? I'm not aware how many of you will take a ticket to Iran or Afghanistan as an example. Because we are a lot of tourism, so you want to go to okay, Queen as part of your uh, adventure. That's what it takes for the first. How much money are we putting in? So we want to get in so much out of the way of nothing. Our point is about to, of course, we have mentioned the motivation of talks about the political environment and how we intend to deal with it to make it natural for people to visit Uganda. The infrastructure, the classification is inadequate, the standardization is crap. Of course, prioritizing religious and cultural tourism, which is our mainstay. And we're having an example in our explanation. But for example, you can actually plan in Namugongo into a Mecca. If you're a good planner for this sector, and what do you need to do? Make available infrastructure to access this place. How can the planner will come off in Namugongo's condition? We have infrastructure, we have hotels. Where well, the underground trains. The CBS government will purpose that area, buy people in phases. If you give us five years, we will buy from Chileka, all surround and create infrastructure and make this our own maker. Is it possible? Culture tourism, common sense. If you went in any region of Uganda with the riches of culture and we purpose that, market it. You're home and dry. Some people visit us not to see gorillas, but to interact with people. Human nature is interactive. But the people will have to mix with others. But we must really make it as part of our approach. We are expanding the array of available place attractions. And that will be our vote on that sector. Continue. Information, communication, technology. A very, very active sector. Misdirected with the plan for structure, high literacy or knowledge of availability, expensive ICT services, but rank high globally as well as the high data coordinations. And of course, we also banned 
Facebook. But it's not official on Facebook. You know, that's how we work somehow. The, the rules are bogus. The reasons we pass in the parliament, you know, is one of them. And of course, our people are poor to access high cost. So, our alternative will be to channel resources into ICT infrastructure, the more PPPs, people are um, partnerships. If you are M2, you are Airtel, and you want to invest in ICT and the same schools access cheap data. So we then look at your tax bill and reduce it and motivate you as part of the arrangement. So I'm going to use this act in that act. It was happening in the following. The next the minutes are almost a good result. The minister complains. The minister prostitutes. The minister has everything to make any sentence you. My brother from the Vice Commission, that's how the UCC Act is like. Last week, the Honorable Williams was asked why they never brought UCC Tribunal to bear as the law says, to put in here down the road. He was, of course, and does. He prefers to be a complainant, a judge, and a prosecutor in his own case. That's how they're working. So, I'm really welcome that act, which is the UCC Tribunal, like I said. And also introduce a social media chatter. Replace the infamous act. We don't have an infamous interact. That's great. But we don't have one on the criminal laws. This chatter, you will read our document, is very elaborated. We would regulate this kind of interaction. And uh, at the different platforms, for you to be able to participate, you will be hard to recommend to commission yourself. I'll be given to you better. If they move in, but I'll tell you as much as here, you don't have to enter it and explain and believe. It's one thing you can do to enable and allow you to share more information with speech, but it will serve you well through speech. Because in some cases, if I'm doing speech and inform the country, and uh, create an individual among the speakers when actually social media is supposed to be interactive and vulnerable. So instead of a document law, we are proposing each other. We each everyone using social media to commit. I am going to commit so much money on reducing ICT. Proceed. East Africa, the African community, yes, we are. Part of us, it's methods of work are translated. There's a lot that is uncoordinated, like I'm writing. The, the terms of, of, of trade are secured against us. The AI election in Uganda are falling, we are completely yellow, and life is going on. If you want to know you ask why you can get a gun, run over body, they'll tell you how it was done here, but it continues. So I will know that part of this mockery if we are a government who insists that anything should be done or we actually put it on it. It cannot be part of a ritual. You cannot take a country into a ritual. If you are serious about integration, it must be integration. It's political integration, it should be political. You say economic, should be really economic. And the world wants to a very serious uh, cooperation and not a ritual. We proceed on our politics, integration awareness. We are aware that public abuse is occasioned by lack of awareness from what the CSC is about, and therefore we would involve the younger people, the youth, in knowledge. We would encourage uh, the business community to be active and get to understand, uh, of course, enhance advocacy. Uh, and implementation of all the protocols. We believe that the ESC is a good idea, but because of our true experience, we're not following the protocols to motivate our people to benefit from the integration and the norms that come with this topic in the community. So we will devote 
that much to reform the whole idea of the ESD. The last time I checked, the minister for ESC was saying he doesn't even have fuel. But he got some college jobs somewhere and to go and do a job. Proceed, work and transport. Yeah, that picture uh, really, the picture as you see there shows you the example of our works and transport. That's what we are. You can go to map of Uganda if you look around the Kampala portholes. Pretty and pretty picture of map of Uganda. Uh, one of the councillor team, that's how your still looks like. Uh, and uh, sometimes I pity myself and, and friends who drive the, the, the small cars, it's going to be consumed whole by a pothole in the camp and disappears. And when you look at the man is voted, I had get to say a complaining, please raise that voice. It's an abuse of our intelligence. That, that little money, that powerful money is voted for infrastructure in Kampala. The problems are not just the children, but they are broken. The problem is alien, and there is the imprisonment, and of course the runaway corruption. I had you and I called you for the other, rejecting the law, and that are awarded from, uh, to the man for transparency. In Parliament, we have been doing about uh, the man of resolution, the Red Fund. The Red Fund Act. We are demanding that for one liter of fuel consumed, as somebody give it to the road fund. I don't know what the percentage. Do you remember? But once, but when, but when you get that percentage, you will be enough money to actually work on the roads. But the regime will really be on this act as non functional. So you find a local government, like uh, the only one that's around there, and it has local government, given 300 million to go and work on the road in Wachisu. It's an insult to common sense. So you probably have about one billion in financial land, one billion. I was in some district in uh, eastern Uganda. And I met councillors, in other councillors, who told me that in this sub county, we built three million to work on the roads. So, what we did, we sat down and shared it and we went home because it was no sense. <laughs> we had been for so many meetings, we had to share it, we shall explain. And that's the image of the country when it comes to that. Suddenly, we want to focus our approaches to maintaining our roads, including road safety, our roads are very dangerous. But also, what's important for us, and this is a, um, a, a pet project for my terms of finance, the last number five, target the key urban roads, especially in the campaign of Grand Area for poor people, it is. You know, every month, and listen to this, every month, one of my only companies in the time, it was 52 companies in the work in traffic jam. You know, it's a problem now. You know, after losing the money. So what you are saying, that instead of that, can we create all roads between Mpiji, Mokono, Wakiso, and Tebe. And when there is a federal road, if you are in a hurry, you want to go and meet good business, use the federal road. But alongside any federal road, there must be another free road. So the first thing we take away from the sea, called. And we know that can be done. In fact, most of the most of it's just lack of imagination. It's like of imagination. We have now this kind of traffic jam in this country. I'm not watching creativity. But you know, that soon, I'm sure members of parliament, of course, my biggest quarrel with my kids here is that they don't keep time. And every time they don't keep time, they say, oh, I'm in a traffic jam. Of course, I don't take that crap. But it's a normal exchange of traffic jam. Every day people lose time because of traffic jam. Something that all roads are okay 
for a given period of time until the money is recovered. Of course, remain a public road. And I want to invite your government leaders that we can really up that advocacy in the Kampala, with the Kampala Metropolitan area for toll roads. Those who are uh, going for quick booms and can pay, of course, not done in the manner of the integrity first highway, which is dark, but the most expensive road in the world. So, we will vote. We will tell you on the buildings. How do you down that much to that sector? Energy and mineral development? The situation dependence on firewood is an accessible and reliable, expensive. We import lots of steel and, uh, and iron. What do we want to do as the opposition? We can have access to renewable energy. We have a lot of capacity to renewable energy. energy. That is lots of I talked a little earlier about the iron ore. In, um, in the West, that we need to exploit to build that gap. Then we have the situation in the oil and the gas sector, which my minister put a lot me in her um, The problem with energy in Uganda is cost and accessibility. Last week, the Ministry of Energy launched 50 megawatts on Karoma. And the country was up in jubilation. Most of that project is late by so many months. They're supposed to produce 600 megawatts, they launched 50. And there's no reason why it's taking that long. And it has not come in I think we are busy fixing the cracks because the procurement was illicit, and that's what you get. When the procurement is not transparent, but they have given us 50 megawatts. What's the name is in the dark? The bulk of the uh, uh, land is in the dark. And the story is Kampala. But we have you. We have unlimited energy on our grid, which we pay for. So, who is really stupefying this nation? So what happened to planning in this sector? So you have the energy, what you put down the area in the energy, the energy, the producers of energy. But our people in the dark. Secondly, our people cannot access power. Those and more regions are wrong. Don't be my distributor to the others. Don't expect so much in this kind of situation where the regime is tired. So, I'm putting uh, 600 megawatts and the government must really line up with the for you. And you are late. This is the sector over which you can generate a lot of revenue in exporting to neighbors, but it requires leadership. That's it. So, we don't have that money to direct that sector. In a trillion, it's 1.4 trillion. Trade and industrial cooperatives. The issue there is high cost of capital, the high cost of energy, like I said, for transport, and even the market access. When you have high cost of money, access makes it be difficult. So, we don't find in the house, we have a bit of our brand in the finance sector, make capital cheaper and accessible by using the cost of operation. Of course, balancing the indigenous capital will be very popular. Indigenous capital is be available when the cost of the local is manageable. When indigenous capital is not available, you are actually sacrificing citizens to bear for any expensive capital, which is a point to freight. So we intend to do with that in, in that manner. The corporate of course, are remembering that this region in the 80s, because we thought that corporate is the same for mobilization of citizens into civic action. And the steps are the government, not in the but the corporate movements, and the 
one point is what do you want to say that? Said, what I learned when I remained by the guitar, that was special to work on the environment. The good and ambiguous pollution, deforestation, and all abundant voices that explain abuse. Our, our solutions will lie in conducting and restoring the environment. And when I was about conducting boundaries and democratic restoring wetlands, finance and national climate change responsible innovations, equip Uganda National Trade Authority. Now that agency, the Uganda National Meteorological Authority. Uh, going back, I used to watch their, their weather forecast on U, UPV and UBC. And what I would say to you, Martina, tomorrow, we should not take it because we will be very hot, not really. Eh? What they say, it will be shiny tomorrow, but we are not there, and they take it in it to rain. The work we are doing the work we are doing the time. You don't understand, they are like a, they are like a witch doctors when they are you know. So, but I think it, when I talk, I say, I keep on calling it planning. Sectors and also we need to be supporting the resources to do a lot professionally and support uh, the the whole planning component. Then we need to clear the out. One of the most important things in the West is weather. Before we have an assessment, we need to put it on the internet and get at the weather forecast, and then we are accurate. It's very very important. You plan for movements, you plan for traffic, and everything. But India is like witchcraft. So we want to invest so much. But one of the issues we want to do is use an audit of the central force reserve. The central force reserve, which can take out of the empire, highly competent with the central force reserve. You either now find eucalyptus, pineapples, uh, sweet potato gardens, and estates. Who actually ate the central first reserve? It accounts for the weather isolation in this country and the entire decline in the predictability of our environment. So we could an audit and we believe it must be fully restored. By restoring it, we restore order in this country, it will create certainty of uh, climate and you reverse the danger of climate change. Work so much in the trillions of the sector. Foreign affairs. Foreign affairs in this country is actually falling. It is that falling that we will never know the foreign policy of this regime. You know, probably the foreign policy is that uh, different months and then the officials travel to any countries that could be the policy, which is why. You can never understand uh, how we relate regionally and internationally. Because the framework is not known, it sometimes does not adhere to international laws and commitments, even the way we are supposed to commit subscription, we don't subscribe. But we don't want to know in some of your sectors, some of the unfamiliar areas are the options. So part of the problem in our foreign policy relates to our staffing. Campaign managers are not turned into diplomats. If you store the most votes, you qualify to be an ambassador. If you store votes and you fail to go through, you still qualify. That is the qualification. You go to some of the nations. I'm not actually an ambassador. And an ambassador actually is a shame to the country. I don't know if you draw any ambassadors in your travels. In one, uh, when I was a member of the park, we visited a mission and we met with the staff and they informed us the ambassador actually overhead the embassy. Is the country, the company officer, was the receptionist. He actually worked for the budget. And he didn't get from his pocket. 
That's how this whole thing works. I can see that I'm back at even now. So come on, you fellows, you are opposed to the other ambassadors. We find a home and we create beddings and private stones. And it gives people and make this country in terms of peace. Now, the next I'm trying to really do proceed. But those of you that have really traveled and be led by to understand the whole concept of deep say, much more deep say, which could be deep say, understand what we are in from the stony age. And this requires a new thinking, which the imagination for us to revamp our standing at the international plane. And our priorities are well streamlined. Recruitment must be purposeful. It's not only really a salary. It's one of the biggest, biggest uh, drawbacks to this area is that uh, we are running out of professional and the career diplomas. Instead, we are recruiting more and more of uh, you know political attaches, military attaches, and, and and of course spies to go and spy on the poverty of the uh, in the diaspora, you know, and switch them into the gym activities. That's it. We're running out of time. Then to move fast. We would avoid that to revamp our foreign policy. Public service and local government situation. Of course, public service is, as we know it, one of uh, the scattered areas. The needs are duplicated. No one is accountable. Corruption is eminent and it needs to be revamped. But part of the area, and of course, first for public service and especially local government, our solutions lie within refuting the agreement and the solution. And the solutions, and, and at the same time, you cannot revamp public service and local government without a comprehensive constitutional review. That's why we propose serious, elaborate, constitutional review. The only one here, Chairman, I will tell you that that was decentralization, now is centralization. The whole concept of power devolution was lost. We need a new convolution as a country. As the nature of the devolution with them. Last month, no, this month, I, I, had, I read a team of these letters to visit the province of Africa with them. Learn the nature of their power devolution. And then we get to understand that we actually bewitched. So, local governance has to be resolved. The current system is a cake, dysfunctional, and it is useless. In a Kenya, you cannot roll back on the powers of the provinces. The money that the special receive from the center is stipulated in the constitution, in the formula. You cannot go to the right one and the because a young man, you see, because you are young, you are going to see the money. The bad way you're not going to get the money. Who wants bad way? So I need a new thinking, a new reading, a new communication, and make our and uh, I want to invite party leader that should be we should offer leadership on this subject as the opposition on the nature of power devolution and the very idea of local governance. Otherwise, our people in local governments are suffering. That you're doing nothing, they are rendered useless. Other DCs are taking over their work. You just find a masquerade in another DC, ignorant, eh? usurping the powers of an old five chair person. So we need to rethink the whole concept of local governance for comprehensive constitutional reforms. Proceed. Presidency. Of course, the presidency today is a clearing house of all nature of deals. 
If you have any deal, McKinney deal, whatever, Tony Quarry, you just look for state house and it will be cleared. So it's got to be the thought because it's the thing of political indiscipline. First of all, indiscipline, political indiscipline is relevant as the president said. So there was a duplicated before the other, then the indiscipline, counter indiscipline, nonsense. Proceed. So the, the whole idea of the presidency requires comprehensive constitutional review because a lot of those are duplicated. On day one, which I feel like other this is, and some recruit of extension workers, cultural extension workers, and then funds shall be returned into other activities. We'll sit down with the others and then, and we invite the president's and spouse, and we shall speak the programs of leaders, which doctors, traditional healers, or the time is required to plan, as well as not a member, the presidency. Proceed. This is a your challenges are legal and administrative. Move, move, move fast. The infrastructure broken. Of course, you'll benefit from the proposal of an infrastructure we have on core roads that should be laid. Give more power for the leaders to determine the urban challenges and address them. And the reason why people elect leaders to determine their fate and their uh, uh, objectives as well as their key demands. Move down. I'm talking about the PPs, low cost housing in the city, redesigning the, 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 the city and its purpose. You know, things that should be done and not be done. First, forward. For you in the financial and carrying more fortunes. Move down justice and question affairs, serious trouble, this backlog, over detention of people, noise violations, civic special shrinking, the eldest science trouble, but the eldest gives us the current judicial officer. So the very critical uh, agency of the level of uh, justice. Now for we have an interaction in Parliament here about what we must set backlog. People from the dialogue sectors were giving their ideas. And some of them were saying let's expand prisons because there is a condition in prisoners. So if you want to just really case backlog, do you want to expand prisons or you, you actually pull them out the officers? So we do not about judicial officers, not every prisoners, we just call them in prisons. You know, so we have common sense work. So you have to use commission prisons. So what you do, expand the prison. You hire more judicial officers. So we would hire more judicial officers, of course. And we're talking about the op uh, operationalizing the magistrate courts, I mean the MCA, because the MCA provides for uh, a limit of both, uh, especially the pecuniary jurisdiction of magistrate courts, but they can handle as several cases as possible to reduce on the backlog. That whole array of solutions for us can be of the judiciary. Proceed. Good of time. Proceed down to the next sector, defense and prison affairs. The troubles are there. Go to the situation as we know it. Armed insurgencies, armed gang, external attacks, terrorism threats, electoral violence, UPD of indiscipline, web mongering, proceed. Where are the troubles in that sector? It's, it requires a tribulate that apparently has diminished for it to be focused. First of all, to streamline the system of recruitment, training, and promotion. The women should receive and a training to the stop in this sector. Public going to be so I've been given this shit by someone that's to be trained as a candidate. What system does that? When you earn that system, you end up with the kind of uh, officer you have. Then the much welfare of the APDF, especially the low rank, the enhanced professionalism. We're talking about something small there. We introduce boarding section, the armor schools. Because military people are shifted and they shift for their children, it's a problem. Their family is also matter. And the regime can never see that. So for school limited children of military people go, they should really be building a little bit of time enough to be in school while they are parents are on state duty. 
uh, the most really uh, simple things, including a many PDF act to move on into members only command. Who does that? Which kind of members of the command? The so and so by birth and public belief is a member of the command. It's only the democracies and it's only democracy that you have that kind of nonsense. Put down. Then the next sector. Move, 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 move. In Ghana affairs, all the similar problems that we have defense. Uh, just a bit on Indian affairs, on the situation, and uh, because we are ending. Yeah, run away criminality, organizing criminal gangs that are opposing, you know, the criminal gangs that are really abusing our people. A part of Indian affairs, and they are part of the criminality that are compromising the, the security citizens everywhere. They are going to perpetrating electoral violence. The question is, where are they recruited from? Who trained them and for what purpose? Inevitably, would cause a restructuring and a retirement, disbandment, and a persecution of some of these fellows when they come to them. In the first six months, we have no choice but to persecute them. In fact, part of some of them from public anger is for us them. Proceed. Working on welfare of uh, the rank and file in that area. I'm naming the NGO Act. The NGO Act is like a military act, not providing space, squeezing the freedom of space and civic space, but of course, have to review it. Not the last sector, we were called bad, which are the best lecture, where me and you are relevant. The best lecture is a clear of government. Problem. You know, a lot of space, you can't manage. The question is, do we need the size of parliament? The 45 million people require 600 members of parliament. You have for the youth. You have for the elderly. You have the EPDF. You have the workers. I had a public transportation. The farmers want their own. But which kind of parliament is this? So all these require, um, I even hear the journalists want their own. You see? Even in New Year's want. Even sex workers, somebody's saying. Remember? So the, the size of parliament is to both a structure burden and also a political problem. So the new parliament for the beginning will require a good solutions to an entire review of the constitution, of major constituencies, question why is there the, the, um, the election, and uh, we have proposed in our document professional representation. Uh, this arrangement, my president, you see in this country, the Israel Commission allocates to your votes. Complete your get yes allocates. My president was allocating and six something or their board. In professional representation, the MVP was only 36 percent of parliament. That's how it works. Okay. But secondly, some people don't need a move in this parliament. They will be for a purpose because under this arrangement. Because this, the current situation is what you call first past the post, winner takes all. Whoever steals for the president, steals for the MP, and you have all that we have. So, under professional representation, you nominate your presidential candidate and you have to work for that candidate. The party normally has a list of potential MPs. For Massacre, you have a list of MPs. Abed Wanika, Mathias Simpuga, Gondala Serungu, Suandiso, Katabazi, you know, Nantungu, and the others. They must go and work to make sure their president gets votes. If there are no votes, no MP, and some vote as that. This being so masculine that I am hoping I will go on a campaign and become parliament alone, you won't come. 
that will save us from gerrymandering and will have constituencies cut. You see, under proportional representation, my constituency has 100,000 voters. I will sit in parliament with an MP who got 3,000 votes. That will be a sub and the constituency. That will not be denied with another constituency because equal proportion, equal representation. That is proportional representation. And that will work on the size of parliament. Who is the UPDF in parliament for the purpose? Who are these workers? They are all workers. When I was in the United States in Kampala, where the one who was in the parliament was in the United States, asked the youth to identify the IUS MP. Everywhere. They are not known and they are not needed. As simple as that. We also have that some MP is not even by their constituents. So I think that is true. The remedy of the Panostra is proportional representation. And I want to invite leaders from our parties from the opposition. This should be part of our demand in comprehensive consumer and electoral reviews. Because it will save the country a lot of trouble. Of course, it's still trouble for the ruling party, but our problem, our 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 goal is not have their troubles, they can do their troubles. As long as the country agrees to our choices. Then we have a company. I can speak about the advantage until the chickens come home. But I saw highlights we've shared. We have a sniper of our ability to change things. And this document, like I said, is a document communicating our readiness to change the thoughts of this country and the same we are ready. Our job, colleagues, leaders here, is to go and tell all and sundry that the opposition is not devoid of ideas. The opposition must be given a chance. The opposition must be given this new space. The opposition must move and speak to the people, and the people must demand for a better government, better services, a better tomorrow, and for posterity. I want to thank you, especially colleagues, uh, members of parliament that supported this work. Peter, the team leader, and uh, your technical team, Dr. Walusin, the, um, Dr. Sozi, and the team for the technical back spot being provided this responsibility. Some days were tough, but because we want to deliver. I now know that in this technical term, I can give the country several PSCs as opposed to the dozing vote or over the corridors of government. Because we don't know what to do. Our political leaders, my dear president and uh, my SG and the leaders, my colleague, thank you for leaving us, supporting us. This work is not ending here. We are here to make an announcement to the country that we are coming and the change will come. This you are pronounced will translate into any agenda. Tomorrow, another day, it's great. It must happen. I thank you so much for getting my country. Thank you very much, uh, Leader of the Opposition. You know, sometimes I wish I was not uh, a technical officer. I, I would have so much to say. But uh, I, I, respect, I respect that I'm a staff of the Institutional Parliament. So I refrain from saying what I'd like to say. 
But thank you very much for all that information that has been given to you. Thank you for fulfilling your, man your mandate constitutionally of delivering an alternative policy to the budget. Now, uh, before we go any further, uh, once again, I would like to thank you for staying with us. We are coming to the end of our program, but I still saw in this group that there are so many people that have not been recognized. And forgive me if I uh, if I miss you out. Uh, Foundation for Human Rights Initiative, Mr. Sempija Abdu, wherever you are, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Nyenge Fred, the district chair, Bukoman CMB, we recognize you. Uh, Mr. Martin uh, Sejemba from MPG, we recognize you. Amutiaba Ibi, Ibi, a student leader, where are you? I hope you're still here. And uh, we're always happy to have uh, young people come and, uh, and, and join us. Um, uh, Dennis Tumuhairwe, chair of UYB, uh, recognize you. Nyom Dimukiri, LC5 Karunguru. Um, Fuge Rehema, uh, the deputy mayor of Rada. Uh, Mr. Robert uh, Sempala, from H uh, the G Journalist Association, Human Rights uh, Network. Uh, Chamongas Timothy, Center for Policy Analysis. Uh, Alira David, uh, the SG, you're most welcome. Uh, Chris Ngasiwe, um, from the NGO Forum. We are happy to have you here. The CEO of the Institute, Mr. Leonard Okello, uh, Zahra Mierica, the speaker at KCCA, and the team from KCCA, I saw it's quite a, a large team. Uh, Mr. Masaba, the deputy speaker as well. Um, the social protection, Honorable Flavia Kabahenda. I know there are so many others that have not been recognized, but uh, we do recognize all of you in your respective capacities, and we thank you for, for joining us today. Now, I will not do justice if I don't invite uh, the political heads here to come and greet you and greet you. So uh, allow me to invite them one at a time. Um, we shall start with uh, Mr. Saddam Gaida from PPP to just come and say hello to you. We'll be followed by uh, Mr. Katerga Mohammed from Justice Forum, and I'll keep updating you as we go along. Please just greet the people, and uh, if you see me stand up, just know your time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. MC, the President of National Unity Platform, the leader of the opposition in Parliament, fellow political leaders, fellow members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, allow me to thank the leader of opposition for the invitation. About a couple of days ago, we had a meeting, a very, very successful meeting with the same leader of opposition with about eight to 10 members of parliament as a party. I will appreciate this opportunity to thank him before he knew the recording relationship that we have had as a party with the leader of the opposition. Whenever we seek for an audience from the leader of the opposition, he does not hesitate to grant us audience. And that of last week was not the first time. I must tell you that last week we had a delegation of seven people from one of the political parties in South Africa, which came here on a study program. And uh, we decided to also uh, seek audience from the middle of opposition, and which audience he granted. And we had a very successful discussion where we even emphasized the proposal that he has just muted to us, which is proportional representation. We had already had that discussion at the party headquarters with those people, and we had internalized from the horse's mouth because that is the system that is practiced in South Africa. So 
Ambassador of Opposition, we are very, very grateful for the relationship that we have as a party. But before I delve into uh, um, the, 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 the budget proposal, we will only comment on a few issues. Let me first make a clarification and also introduce myself the purposes of those who may not know me or the party like who are not the of me. Of course, I don't like to be was just quoting a joke because he's somebody who have been battling within trenches for so many years. He's my member of parliament in Bush. And we have been on the same committee that has been campaigning for President Robert Chiagurani in the in the last election. So I know he knows and he knows the party, but I'm the acting national chairperson or national chairman of the People's Progressive Party. Uh, majority of people uh, uh, prefer to call me acting president, but in People's Progressive Party, we have a national chair, we don't have president. So I'm the acting chair. Our Secretary General is Doc, uh, Mr. Opi. Please, can you stand up for recognition, please? So that Mr. Manga Chirendi does not uh, mistake <laughs> uh, in future. And our MP, only MP, is Honorable Sandra of course. Um, to throw more light about her, uh, 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 her presentation, she did not come alone as a member of parliament. She came with 12 councillors in the constituency. So the party has one MP and 12 councillors. Um, allow me, the members, ladies and gentlemen, to specifically thank President Robert Chagrani. As much as I was part of his campaign team, but when the campaign ended and he was about to appoint the shadow cabinet, I and my MP visited his home and we had a lengthy discussion about what was happening. And that is where he decided that to week to appoint our MP in the shadow cabinet. I would like to know if he has no support in this appointment. Thank you specifically for including us in your community. But in a special way, I also want to thank you. Because what makes a leader is not being rhetoric, is not being hard working, it's bank, is being able to identify capable members around him. I don't know whether you have ever read about a book called Being No Members Around Me. Once you read it, then you can understand what makes a success a successful leader and effective leader. A, a success a, an effective leader is a leader who can manage to identify leaders around you who can, uh, you know, who can perform duties that he cannot perform himself. And when I saw Honorable Manga Chivunda making a presentation, when I saw Honorable Mpuga here making a presentation, you know, you will be a tick, you will be a leader, because that is only the success. The capacity, the Managed to identify those people is alone a success, even if you don't succeed yourself, because you are not going to do everything alone. So I want to stand here and thank you for being a leader. I know that in a political party like ours, in the Kiowas, we always have the moderates, we always have. Sometimes they call them, they refer to them as radicals. I don't want to refer to them as radicals, but we always were a certain And once you have these two groups, 
we have to be in a position to balance the two. How we can live the rightists and the rightists. But I want to assure you, you have also passed that test because you are having the two groups, but you have money to put them together and uh, you have money, but have now managed to show a difference, more especially given where we have been coming from. Even bringing us together as political parties, the support point, the mother of the Indian political party in the opposition. This has not been uh, uh, the usual business. It has been rare for a Indian political party in the opposition to bring together all political parties. Because you know we have different approaches. That's like people's progress in part of which is uh, 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 non-confrontational, which is uh, which does not sometimes engage in uh, demonstrations. You know, this approach is different. But to have a new part in your position, the party which is not with the same approach with the leading political party in your position, it is a rare, a rare, rare attribute that you have as a leader. I want to commend you for that, and I want to ask those honorable members to clap for our president. I think he has done a good job. Um, I will comment about only two or three issues, and I will just make proposals. Um, I have seen our proposal, uh, or the proposal in the alternative budget about agriculture, with what we intend to do. But um, one of the problems that our farmers are facing is the fluctuation of the prices of their crops, of their products. Once you don't have a solution for that, you will give them money, you will give them a reduction, you will give them everything, but... <laughs> let, let, let me take this opportunity. <laughs> we introduce my only friend, Honorable Now, the facto, the de facto president, he is not in that way. But without using my point, Honorable Members, we can give the farmers irrigation. We can give them assurance about the products that we buy. But as long as we don't look into the stabilization of the prices of the products, we are not going to develop. Because today, as I speak, the surprise that you have this from November, people are as we speak, Nilza has been at 100, at 1,100 shillings. The people there today don't need any seeds because they saw the families at a higher price. They can now buy the seeds. When they sell their means at 500 shillings, nobody shall grow means the following season. To another, even that is what happens with the fluctuation of prices. What governments used to do in the past was to put a stabilization fund that used to buy all the crops during the peak seasons, and the government would wait for the prices to go up, right? And then the government will now bring in the means and sales. But also, whether there will be shorter results, again, government will use that same steps that it, it should have built from the farmers now come 
and and rescue the people from food shortages. So I will have to uh, propose that we should look in, look into stabilization of the prices, but we should also look in uh, establishing or setting up silos where really farmers uh, uh, can keep their means because they can't keep up in the houses when the prices are low. It is government that can help them set up silos or stores where they can keep it and wait for the prices to stabilize. The second thing I wanted to comment on is about domestic borrowing. On the position, as we speak now, government is borrowing domestically in commercial banks. That means that even uh, private individuals are competing with government in the banks. And you cannot imagine where a private investor or a private businessman can compete with the state, with the government, in the banks. The banks shall prefer, always and naturally, shall prefer to borrow the government than borrowing a private individual because the security for that money is the government is certain. It's very certain one hundred percent. So you will find that now the business people are competing with the government in another way. So I would like to propose that that budget proposal will be a uh, the the mistake. Um, lastly, Mr. Chairman, I know Mr. Mr. Leader of Opposition, you have set the standard of the leader of opposition high. I know that if we had a said government, it was going to happen to what you have produced. And the government will crush their own budget accordingly. But we don't have one. We don't have the same government. What you have produced is naturally going to remain in, on the hands of the parliament and in the archives of our uh, 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 parliament, and sometimes it can it may help for academic purposes. But in future, what we have said, in the future, I think no legal opposition is going to perform below this. This is a standard you have set, and I'm very sure and certain that in future it will help us so much. But one thing I have to talk about is our commitment as opposition because the government is not going to do anything about this budget. That one will not for sure. It is us who must come to power as opposition to make this a reality, what has been submitted here. But we have a duty. We are talking about the time we are coming. Sometimes we want to blame us, but we have the duty as opposition leaders. The people out there need us to unite, need us to build the synergies, need us to build one force to get rid of this autocratic regime. We shall only get rid of this autocratic regime when we get together. That's like I said, we have different approaches. Others are liberals, others are assertive, like I said, I wanted to use that assertiveness. We have to, because we all contribute to the same cause. We all contribute to the same cause. We need to work on our two petty issues and look 
at the bigger picture. The bigger picture. They have already given us the leadership. At least Honorable Robert Chagulani and the leader of the opposition have already shown that they can do it the way they They can do it the way. What is remaining of it? Is to appreciate our differences, reduce the gaps. I've it. God will put in issues and focus in the, in the objective that we want to achieve. One way to do that, and you will have to do it, you can do it, to do it. but when you want to do that, that's the region. I'll give this to you. Yes, you come up, throw it back at me. I'll give this to you, Max. I once again thank the people of the opposition for the invitation, for the working with the relationship with the boss. We need to recognize what we do, which is the political part in the opposition. And we shall not deviate from the course. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Saddam Gaira. He, has, of course, has left me with such a challenge because, uh, you know, if speeches were being given out uh, through proportional representation, we will be here for the whole day. But I'm going to ask that uh, when Justice Forum comes and going forward, we shall limit it to just a minute or two. Let's just greet the people and uh, so that everybody can have an opportunity to speak. So, Mr. Katerega Mohammed, SG, please come and greet the people. Thank you. The leader of the opposition, the Honorable uh, Matthias Mpunga, the leaders uh, present, my colleagues, the SGs, one of the members of parliament, the federal cabinet, ladies and gentlemen. I salute you in the name of God. I'm going to be very brief and I'm not going to comment on the submission made by Matthias Simpunga because I'm convinced and uh, I'm convinced of what he has uh, presented. I can only make a commitment that I will take out, I will have a conversation with my people in the Justice Forum over this because Ugandans need to know the alternative. And I want to the fears which uh, uh, Mr. Saddam has, that it is going to remain on the archives and the uh, rest of the parliament. We are going to keep out the community. We are going to preach it, and we are going to inform the community of what is taking place, the rules, the budgets which the inner is running, the gaps by we said, you know, you know, I have uh, one observation. When you are presenting your speech, there are some members who moved out. Uh, I suppose they went for prayers. I want to make a formal request to that um, because we are going to be to respect time. If I'm not here at nine, I will be waiting us. By the time, we'll be out of this room. I want to make a request that in future we avoid those honest movements. So movements, people go and do this and that. But we are going to make such a failure. So that uh, everybody, and people are uncomfortable. I don't have doubt that because I was uncomfortable, it would have, people didn't understand me. So I'm requesting that in future you are out of need to organize. A function like this one in the morning on Friday or other people in which uh, be comfortable coming or participating in such uh, organization. So, uh, you know, you should allow me to bring this from just one and allow me to thank the members of government for the same to the past brief. For us, the general. Let me put two measures which put a lot of emphasis in the values. 
As we said in Jena, that may be the best requirement to be living for a match. And uh, so, I think that you will see in the present, as done, it comes the best now, as done, I shall come back to you and request you to read the thing so that uh, the Bible is taken back to you in its current form as we passed it. Well, those of you us, ladies and gentlemen, allow me once again to thank the opposition for events in this area to be part of this historical uh, event. I think this is the first uh, type of value to be submitted. Maybe, or maybe the second one. And uh, I'd like to take a lesson from what I want to agree with you, Mr. Saddam Gaya, that uh, you have raised the bar, and those who will succeed you will have uh, a very good plan. I thank you very much, and uh, I request, Mr. Dr. Professor, after this, you allow me to go and catch up with the players. May God bless you, for God and thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Katerega. And I'm sure your comments have been noted and well taken care of. Uh, now, let me invite uh, Dr. Kilama Omero from UPC to please come and uh, greet the people. Sorry. Um, the president of me, who is a woman, his party is leading in the opposition. A man from the great background. And Matthias, who is the knob, I'm also called Matthias or Matthias from Gulu, and actually from Gulu. I am in UPC since 1968. I'm a doctor. My profession in health, and I've served as a doctor for the six years. Until now, I've not yet retired. I worked in government, but retired, but I'm not tired. I was this morning ambushed. I was in my clinic treating my patients. So, my secretary, General Honorable Bill rang me and said, please, we don't have Jimmy is away. I'm in this pause. Please, you go and stand for us. I've never been a member of parliament. Although I contested for the seat in 2006, under the UPC ticket, I lost. The following day, I came to my clinic and I continued doing my job. <laughs> I was a member of the Presidential Policy Commission appointed by Dr. Apple Milton Obote, and I served there in Uganda House for six years with Dr. Rangarare. Honorable Santa Court, I remember you came to my house, and many others, the Olanya, the, you know, and then uh, and everybody else. I worked with them. I almost mentored them. So, my humble request is we need to be united. We need to build Uganda 
which is a pre-Israel cell and a means with the labor. Because the stability of this nation rests squarely with the accessibility of social services, not in the reach of the majority of the people of Uganda. And my view, Uganda is an artificial nation brought together by the consensus of the of the 1962 Lancaster Agreement. Otherwise, we want that artificial nation to progress. Then we need a concerted effort by the leadership of this nation called Uganda to play its role without any form of discrimination. Otherwise, an artificial thing disintegrates when you don't bring the forces of uniting them together. So our leader must work tirelessly to make sure that the nation is united. You turn out to be a, a golden chief or, my, or, or whatever. If you look at your where you are born, or and do the business of the nation, that's not work. This leader operation, I agree with my fellow. We set up a very high standard. I love him not because he's, my, he's called Matthias and I'm also Matthias. No. He's eloquent. He knows what to do. He knows what to say. He knows how to argue. And then I did this. When you based your political party from the colors, when the man decided to be late, I, as a leader in the Uganda People's Congress, they asked me why this is our color. I said, Look here, you guy. This man here. His blood is red. All that it could be there for A, B, C, A, B, A, B, and O. But the color is red. Whether you go to Russia, or you go to Ukraine, or you go to Japan, or Brazil, or Argentina, or whatever, you have red colors in their blood. So when this morning I come here, he asked me why am I not put on my red tie. I said, look here, I'm a professional doctor practicing. I just came here because I was called. I don't have to scare somebody by putting on red. If it's yellow, fine, let it be. It is otherwise. So if Green. Yesterday, I think we met, I had a good one, a very nice suit, a green sort of tie, because I had some function that went to. Now, people of Uganda, corruption is something we should not accept it. And it's cancerous. It is due to skullduggery. Skullduggery is a strong English word, which means the highest level of dishonesty. The highest level of dishonesty that is skullduggery is eating up our society. Look here. There was a time when a minister in the 1980s, the top minister about was the president then, a minister went to the Bank of Uganda. Because you know that president, he went out with 20, 
Dollar, a thousand dollars take a lot of money. And if you use $15,000, dollars, it becomes the five thousand dollars in the Bank of Uganda. How many members today will leave this country? Some and you will show so we see. Some of us have been years. I studied in Russia, I studied in Germany, I went to Britain, and I studied here. I'm well balanced. When we talk of Lviv, where the, the war is taking place, or Kiev, or Moscow, or where, or the stock went down, and those places I know, I've been in those places that are balanced. So, we should be also balanced in our mind. We should unite to leave this country. My thought was from this nation. Look at that direction. You don't want to go to a new because a new one is new. You don't want to go to a new one. You don't want to go to a new one. Far away from them. So I agree with what you say. You talk about Uganda. You do see. Is it this bank called what? What is this bank of the or Uganda house? What is that bank? UCB, correct. UCB was formed for the benefit of the common man. Whether we like it or not, we African, we are social, we are more socialist orientated than the European, than the communist China or Russia or whatever. And the purpose of UCB is to enable the people of Uganda to move forward. Bank. the it was by uh, Edward East and destroyed our nation because we were at par with Singapore. We are going to be Singapore today. We talk of the health. Oh, we are not happy because we begin nine years with you. We can see all students scattered all over the country. North, South, East, West, without discrimination. Because we are building the peace of the South and the peace of labor. We are building the peace of the South and the peace of labor. We are consulting the government. The third, the second, that's the parliament. There was an attempt one time from Southern Sudan only to enter Uganda, but it was stopped there and then. My late brother Alex Ogiera was there. We progressed very fast. Alex Ogiera was Minister of Information, broadcasting and he was the brother. 
It comes from political background. That's why since 1968, I've been really the people sleepless. And our headquarters was also been by And to show you, uh, our president didn't come from the West or West. In fact, he introduced one by three. He cannot come to parliament when he cannot second it by who I'm from Bulgaria. I must be so seconded from East, West, and Uganda. It's not to unify. You find the country. You find the country. You find the country. You are working. But I don't know. Well, you abandon. I think this is not my time. I've been invited to my Secretary General, Honorable Abil, to come and represent the Uganda People's Congress. Not to my background. And I would say, let us unite. Unite for the purpose. Unite not to hate anybody. Unite so that the people of Uganda, people from Nairobi, people from Tanzania, will come for treatment in Kampala and Mulago. They will come for night dances from Nairobi. Oh, it is the other way around. So I can see him standing. I don't like to be in discipline in one way or another. I thank you very much. I'm called, my name I want to repeat again, Dr. Kilama Moro Matthias. Thank you very much. I must thank uh, Dr. Kilama Matthias. I now know that uh, if ever I have uh, another son and I want him to be eloquent, the name Matthias has got to be in there somewhere, somehow. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, thank you for keeping the flag of UPC flying high. Now, in, in our midst, I still want to recognize uh, um, Hajat Nambawa, Rashida, LC5 Butambala. Uh, where are you? Yes, uh, Hajat, thank you so much. Um, Mayor Mukambwe, Lukonge, from Mitiana Municipality. Yes, we recognize you. Thank you very much. There are several editors and talk show hosts that joined us. And we really must thank you for, for keeping information flowing. Uh, the other arm of government, of course, state. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, last but not least, uh, the former leader of the opposition, Honorable Betty Awala Chan. Um, thank you very much, Madam. And thank you for keeping uh, the steps moving forward. Now, um, allow me to invite Dr. Lulu Mebaiga representing the Democratic Party, to kindly come and just greet the people. I, I'm, I'm going to ask that you, you keep your notes away so that you can easily greet the people. Right now, you will leader of opposition, Honorable Matthias Improgan Samba, Honorable Robert Chagulanyi, President of the National Unity Platform and the leading party in the opposition, representatives of political parties, colleagues, members of parliament, leaders in various categories, ladies and gentlemen, Right on our speak, we are on a little opposition. <laughs> May I request the colleagues here to clap for you for this achievement today. This alternate time speech on the budget is a real wake up call to all Ugandans to start to look at Uganda as we are and to ensure that everybody wakes up to the realities that are occurring in our country. 
We have heard that we are living in a very artificial life and listening to very artificial figures. And that is what Ugandans continue to consume. Without this speech, very many Ugandans, including members of parliament and, and leaders of various categories, would have gone with the figures of government which are very artificial. And that is why we must congratulate ourselves as a opposition in this country for having a very brilliant opposition, which, is en which has enabled us to know that this country can have another path that Ugandans can follow to make our country deliver for everybody. Let me make a few comments. I just need three minutes of uh, your valuable time. On health, I have a health background. Everybody has been talking about health insurance. I was in Rwanda just recently. And the country which President Museven doesn't want to hear that they are making big, very big progresses. Being younger than them and he was taking them as his own house boys. They have fast tracked health insurance and everybody has access to health and quality health. This is something that we need to fast track and we need to put our feet on the ground and show the world that this is also possible in this country and it is possible. The second thing I wanted to comment about is on land and environment. Yes, we need to audit the processes and outcome of the land giveaways, especially the public land giveaways. We also need to audit how forests have been acquired in this country, where parts of land, especially in Uganda, have been given away at giveaway prices, and natural forests, in natural forests being planted eucalyptus and pine. And nobody has any right to fetch firewood in such land which we are helping our people to get fuel. This is very rampant and it must be reversed. Through legislation and through activism to prevent this kind of acquisition of forest land. Those forest lands are going to be populated new populations of people. In the middle of the villages where people don't have land to make a living, and they pay paltry 320,000, and somebody gets two square miles of forest land. Right Honorable Leader of Opposition, this must be stopped. Must bring it to Parliament. And if at all Parliament is not enough, we must lead a campaign to reverse it. We must all possess that land which has been given away, public lands which have been given away. Because public lands are given away conditionally. Those people who are conditioned to, to take this land through the corrupted land boards, they do other things other than why they acquired that land. And Ugandans have not been keen on how these, are, these lands are being acquired. We know the processes. We must lead this campaign to reverse the possession of this land. And those people living adjacent to these lands must acquire them because that is what the law provides. And the law has been always circumvented and people have always been chased away from their lands. Thank you for commenting on the PDM. It is a still bath. And the still baths are very painful. I know, I know President Seven is listening. <laughs> we were laughing at you. Well, this thing was very badly brought up. We were the third world pro largest producer of coffee. We didn't have large estates of coffee. But Ugandans were stimulated by having a steady market and guarantee of market, international market for coffee. But even under it, I mean, that, that. The man who had been curtailed from attaining international 
poorer and markets, being a dictator, as he was called, although an achieving dictator than the ones that we have today, Uganda, Uganda managed to survive. We managed to survive by the sale of our coffee, and we are the third world biggest producer of coffee. Today, we are nowhere because this country ran away from its responsibility of ensuring that our primary producers get ready and guaranteed market as a stimulus for their efforts. You cannot reward effort by nothing. You cannot say that the 39% of the people who, to whom you are targeting 100 million per parish, one size fits all, are also going to work out their market for their produce at a global market, which should be the stimulus for effort. I think this, this needs to be given to President Seven Point Blank so that he can unlearn running away from guaranteeing markets for the Ugandans and thinking that you are going to give 100 million in a parish, one size fits all, is going to be like any other programs that have been started by him before. And he's going to die a very frustrated man because he has not managed to pull Ugandans out of poverty to prosperity. And we are here to help him as an alternative to ensure that he knows that when we speak, he should also listen. Since he is still steering a little bit, then he can do some, maybe some wonder can come when he listens one time. A few Ugandans can be pulled out of poverty to prosperity. But when he continues not to listen, and these programs continue to be for him, he will die a very frustrated man, not, not being able to establish a new dispensation where people live happily. I want once again to thank you so much for convening this assembly and delivering that speech. I sat with my colleague, Honorable Rumo, behind there because we are MPs, members of parliament like others. And when I heard the MC announcing that Honorable Mao is going to sit there, I thought that there was a label on the chair. But you know, he, he left our party and entered the NRM, he's a minister. So I, I am now there. It is me you should always invite this way. You don't have my country, thank you very much. <laughs> It's a good thing I'm a civil servant. I will not comment on some things. But uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lulume. Thank you for uh, hosting the flag for the Democratic Party. In the meantime, once again, I recognize uh, the speaker, Lua Charles, from Makindi Division. Yes, thank you for joining us. Mayor Mulenzi Bamu from Iganga Municipality. Thank you for joining us. And I know there are many local government leaders and local government uh, officials who are here. Could you just stand, just uh, wherever you are, please uh, just rise to your feet. All the local leadership that is here. There, there are quite a number. We could not recognize you individually, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, allow me to invite a representative from FDC, Ms. Doreen Yanjira. Uh, please come and uh, greet the people. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, MC, uh, the President Noop, the leader of opposition, fellow leaders from other political parties, and to all ladies and gentlemen, Good afternoon. I bring you warm revolutionary greetings from my president, the Honorable Patrick Amriat. He's not been able to join us. He lost a brother, but I'm here to represent him. And without making any further submissions, allow me to recognize some of uh, the leaders from FDC. 
I've seen the former leader of the opposition, the Honorable Betty Owl. You look smart in blue. I've also seen our um, Secretary for Mobilization, the Honorable Fungal Cups. He's also a former member of parliament. He's just walked in. And of course, we have several other members of parliament. I was, of course, ambushed, but uh, that does not mean that I will fail to make a submission. Uh, colleagues, first of all, allow me to thank the leader of opposition for offering this alternative budget. You can clap. Well, unlike the Matia Kaseja budget, whose sole objective was to own a patronage system and offer illusions about poverty eradication to the ordinary citizens through new thought out programs like the Polish Development Model, the alternative budget offers concrete, actionable spending priorities that have the capacity to transform the lives of the ordinary citizens. And for me, true leadership demands for that. Of course, when you look at the budget that was presented, it placed the biggest chunk of the national resource envelope in the hands of our central government. The local governments where the citizens live and work were given just a small share of the resources. And of course, uh, this is not rocket science. Uh, if I'm to give an example of KCCA, and I, I want to thank the leader of opposition, he talked about KCCA being offered $2 trillion a year. Uh, our strategic plan was talking about $1 trillion a year. Of course, we tried to squeeze the little resources that we have. So when resources are left at the center, it definitely leaves a lot to be desired. But uh, we, thank what, we thank you for what you have presented, and we are going to carry the alternative budget that we have received today. We are going to carry it, we are going to read it as our Bible, because it clearly means about us. And of course, during your submission, you kept on referring to the, you kept on referring to the IGG, and I actually wanted to give my submission when she was here, and I kept wondering whether you have taken time to really understand what she goes through. Um, we know that she's been trying to do her level best, but under the circumstances, I remember there's a time she was conducting an audit on the scale, and uh, she was warned, she was told, please go slow. As long as people steal resources and they invest them in this country, do not run after them. So really, I would be demanding a lot from her. And of course, there was a comment recently, I don't know if you saw a letter that was circulating all over social media and they are telling her, please do not run after our men and women in uniform. So really, for us to expect miracles, for us to expect her to perform, would be asking for, for too much. And uh, like we all know, we lose 10 trillion, ladies and gentlemen, 10 trillion a year to corruption. And of course, for us in the opposition, yes, our budget has been presented, an alternative has been given, but when you actually read the report that was presented by the IGG, and over the years, the most corrupt institution has been, do you know it? Uganda police, Uganda police. The next that follows in line was the judiciary was the judiciary. The next that followed in after the judiciary was the Lands Commission. I don't know if you're seeing the kind of country that we are talking about. We are talking about a country that is in, is in shambles. We are talking about a country that is in tatters. And definitely the responsibility to reform, to transform and to liberate this country lays within us. And those that came before me talked about unity. I'm here to rally all of you that we need 
who stand against being divided. We need to stand against being divided or else we shall come here and read the beautiful speeches. Unfortunately, we shall not be able to do much. I'm quite passionate about uh, issues of gender. I'm quite passionate about issues to do with education. And I recently was actually embarrassed and shocked after celebrating Women's Day under the theme of digital transformation most of the government entities, KCC inclusive, was not allocated a single queen for ICT. But I mean, the country is celebrating Women's Day. And we have our leaders, I saw the Honorable Joyce Bagala, I think all of us saw her and what happened her yesterday when she was attempting to offer an alternative. We've talked about the parish development model which is total crap. And you know, when you go and look in most of the budgets, there was no money that was allocated to women. There was no money that was allocated to youths. There was no money that was allocated to people living with disabilities. And we are told that the money was put under the parish development model. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to raise to the occasion and say, Enough is enough because this is what those that we represent the world of us. The other thing that uh, is very dear to me is the education system, like I told you. I represent Macquarie University, but I also come from um, a background that is full of teachers. I want us to analyze our education system and specifically at how much is allocated, specifically for those who go. Uh, for UPE. In Uganda, each pupil is allocated 9,300 shillings a year. And for your information, when the current vice president was the Minister of Education, she said people needed to celebrate because that was increased from 6,000 to 9,000. Now, we know that when I got many, many thousand, they translate to two point five dollars a year. So, we know that Kenya, for the whole speech, dollars a year. So, we know that Egypt, they are located at 150 dollars a year. South Africa, I think it's 1,500 dollars. I am. They allocate two point five dollars. When you look at Britain, they allocate seven thousand eight hundred dollars a year. When you look at Norway, they allocate one. They allocate two thousand dollars a year. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you are talking about education, if you are talking about transforming this country, what exactly are you talking about? When we talk about competition at the national level, at the international level, what exactly are we talking about? We need to do more than what we are currently doing. As FBC, we have now and again advocated that greater resources must go where people are, where the taxes come from. Taxes do not come from central government. When resources come closer to the people, we no longer talk about bringing services to the people because the people will have the power to retain their needs and deal with themselves because they will have the means to do so. Now, of course, the concentration of resources at the center has brought corruption and impunity. The words reside right at the top. And I want to emphasize that the thugs reside right at the top. This country is yet to recover from one of the most shameful scandals, at least for me, the one that I have seen in the annals of corruption, the Kalamoja Iron Ships scandal. The thieves without shame told the world that the Iron Ships had delivered themselves states. You know, to 
fact matters worse, this was something that was coming from the Ministry of Finance. Someone entrusted with our resource envelope. Is it not a shame? So, ladies and gentlemen, there is no way the budget objectives can be realized. Are we laying our resources before they go to the intended beneficiaries? There is no way the budget objectives are going to be realized. But please, are we laying our resources before they get to the intended beneficiaries? And therefore, for me, the only solution that I have, for all of you that know me, I am an activist for change. Because I believe there is little that we can do under the current dictatorship. If we indeed need change, if we indeed must talk about good governance and the rule of law, we need to leave our comfort zones. Ladies and gentlemen, this country is crying for leadership. This country is crying for those that are going to lead them. And I have no doubt we have what it takes to command and change this country. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Nyanjira. And thank you, FDC. I think your comments have been received and understood. Now, uh, distinguished guests, we are coming to the end of our program today. Um, as we wind up, I just wanted to inform you about uh, what the procedure will be. After our final remarks today, there shall be a group photograph on the steps of parliament, and would like to invite you to join the team on the steps uh, of parliament. So right now, I'm going to invite uh, the leader of the opposition in parliament to kindly come and make his closing remarks, and thereafter invite uh, the president of the National Unity Platform to also come and make remarks. Right. Mr. Peter Odeke, now that you've returned, I want to invite the audience to appreciate you for uh, moderating us so well. Thank you so much. We have back with this for being a civil servant. Our government requires civil servants like you. I think I'm able to get work done. Thank you. And this is a gentleman that's been a long day. And we have done for justice to the reasons of being here. I'm saying partial justice because when it ends here, then it's a west. It's a launch of uh, a protracted struggle to calm the hills and valleys and escarpments of our own nation, to bring to bear to all and sundry that this country deserves better. When I invited my president to be part of this audience, of course, characteristic of him, he was questioning the wisdom of this kind of audience. I told him, it is your audience, sir, please give me a scab and address it because the nation is to hear from you because they missed you in State House. That's what we should be doing, we should have been doing. Now the remaining proposition to the country, but the beauty is we are around and we shall outlive our enemies. And we shall see now that we can implement our beautiful ideas to Maryland. I, I, I got a text message from a citizen listening in or watching on TV and was asking me, so you are saying you're going to construct beautiful projects in Kampala. So how about for us in the rural areas? Are you abandoning us? Simple response I've sent him. We are going to put our money where the money comes from, which are equalized for the other areas when you need more money. That's how economics is done, simple economics. You need money where it is. Don't put money if it's a road and the people are putting, uh, are doing castle of your need just know that that community lacks the basics before giving them a, a road to like cassava. 
We have no hospital, we have no schools, first things first. We will receive the rest. Mr. President, sure day, uh, we have a lot of impressions for this. Yes, I've been mentioned watching you, sir. Most welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, distinguished guests, fellow leaders, ladies and gentlemen. I still feel that the right to noble liberal position has not been appreciated enough this afternoon for the elaborate. So, may I request a standing ovation? for our leader of the position. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was really, really impressed by your wide reaching knowledge to the extent that you even touched the radical area, which is my background. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the leader of the position was right. Music is actually both an art and a science. The scientists that are here with us this afternoon will agree with me that science is based on laws and principles. And yes, the artists like Dr. Wilderman will agree with me that art is based on creativity and innovation. But as a musician and other musicians out there, until you study music from the highest level, that's when you're going to understand that actually music has laws and principles. And yet, it continues to run around creativity and innovation. So thank you very much for that insight. I write to number one of the position. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be here today as our parliamentary front launches this alternative budget proposal for the year, the financial year 2022, sorry, 2023-2024. Many times, regime apologists tend to claim that we do not present any alternative views for Uganda's future. But as you all know, that our 2021 manifesto gave clear and achievable policy alternatives, and uh, we have labored to elaborate these on various occasions. The last time I was here at Parliament, our parliamentary front was launching its legislative agenda. We are again here to highlight some of our policy alternatives and proposals that we would, you know, use to usher Uganda into a new opening. Unfortunately, the guns have not allowed us to have uh, that opportunity, but we still believe that we have that opportunity. I want to thank you for today, uh, right Honorable Leader of Opposition and your team. This. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you heard, our alternative budget proposals are rooted in the principles of universal human rights and equality. Um, human rights are not a luxury, ladies and gentlemen. It is a fundamental aspect of human dignity that should be respected and protected in all aspects of life, including economic policy. We believe that every Ugandan deserves the opportunity to succeed, regardless of their background or the circumstances. We believe that it is possible to build a Uganda that works for everybody, not just a select few. The human rights approach is centered on the idea that economic policies should prioritize the rights and well-being of all people, especially the vulnerable ones. Unfortunately, here in Uganda, that is not the case. The Ugandan economy, as you all know, is characterized by gross corruption, inequality, and lack of opportunities for the majority of our people. Wealth and power are concentrated in the hands of a small group. And that is why we need an alternative budget, which truly represents and prioritizes the needs and aspirations of all Ugandans, not just the few that hold power and influence. The alternative budget is not just a collection of numbers and figures. It is indeed a reflection 
of the values that we hold so dear as a party and as a team. Our national budget must prioritize the investments in sectors that will create jobs, that will improve people's livelihoods, and will enhance economic growth. Special attention should be given to health and education, and of course, social protection programs that will benefit the ordinary Ugandans. We must invest in healthcare to ensure that every Ugandan has access to quality and affordable healthcare services for the purposes of increasing their product productivity. Our healthcare workers and teachers must be paid and paid well. We must focus on creating an environment that is conducive for business growth, job creation, and all other developments. This requires deliberate investment in infrastructure, including roads, railways, and yes, the energy sector. We must reduce the burden of taxes and regulations on small and medium-sized businesses. Otherwise, we shouldn't expect peace in a country where young people are broke, are unemployed, and are hopeless. We must ensure that everyone has access to resources that they need to succeed in life. And this means investing in social protection programs such as universal health care and social security. Last year, ladies and gentlemen, this parliament passed the National Health Insurance Scheme Bill, but up to now, the bill has not yet become law. It is a shame that 61 years after independence, we still rely on the foreign development partners to meet 41% of our health expenditure. The government of Uganda caters for only 16% and leaves the big burden to the ordinary citizen. We do not have a national health insurance scheme in place. The available health insurance plans are almost all private schemes. And yet, even then, they cover less than 2% of the population. Now, I did not say they cover 2% of the population. I said they cover less than 2% of the population. I believe many of you, if not all of you, have been following the scandal at NSSF. Over 14 trillion shillings of private employee savings is at risk of being stolen because of greed. And of course, it's being stolen by those that have power and influence. The situation is even worse at the police officer circle, the exodus circle, and the military officer circle, the Razalundo circle. The high ranking officers find it almost impossible to access the savings, which savings are actually forcefully deducted off their salaries. Billions are allocated to security, the security sector. But my friends, when you look at the livelihood of the men and women in uniform, which is sad. No wonder many soldiers and police officers are angry, bitter, and frustrated. And they end up venting that frustration and anger on the innocent citizens. Recently, many of you saw in the media that some police officers have actually gone to court over salary cuts. That's where we are now. I want to say it again, ladies and gentlemen, that our government will ensure that those who keep our nation safe and better with our own paid officer earning at least one million shillings. This, this will help because if we pay them better, then we shall have the moral authority to demand that they treat the citizens better. If we treat them with dignity, they will treat our citizens with dignity. It's unfortunate that the regime continues to marginalize and isolate significant sections of our population. An old saying used to be that we shall not wait for Karamoja to develop. But today, a few elites in the regime, including the Speaker of this very parliament, the Vice President, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Ethics and Integrity, and many others, they have decided to say we shall not allow Karamoja to develop. Ladies and gentlemen, it is sad, very sad, that anyone here 
who has traveled to Karenga or Kopide or Abim and seen other poverty ravaged areas in Karamoja and seen the misery there. I'm sure they're still questioning why those thieves are still in office. I'm personally wondering and shocked that those Ugandans that protested the theft are in prison today. But the thieves are in office, they're being guarded and rewarded. That's where we are. Ladies and gentlemen, implementing these proposals requires a change in the allocation of resources. So we must cut spending in areas that do not necessarily contribute to the well-being of our people. We should not continue wasting money buying tear gas and killing machines because these are just for terrorizing our people. We need to use our money better. It is not logical, ladies and gentlemen, that the police and the military were allocated, they were allocated nine trillion in this current budget. Nine trillion for police and the military. And the agriculture sector, which employs over 70% of Uganda's working population, was allocated only 1.4 trillion. We must restore hope in the thousands of young Ugandans who line up every day at Entero Airport in search for better life outside Uganda. And unfortunately, many of them, as you've seen, end up facing more indignity and more humiliation outside Uganda. Of course, with no protection and care whatsoever from the authorities here. We must increase the domestic revenue by cracking down on corruption. My sister has mentioned that we lose 10 trillion to corruption. It could be more. Because in Uganda, you can't even trust the numbers that they cook up every day. But we must increase the domestic revenue by, you know, cracking down corruption and implementing a fair tax system. And that way, we shall collect much more than the 25.8 trillion, which you all know cannot even finance half of our national budget. So I want to invite all of you, ladies and gentlemen, especially civil society organizations and private sector players to engage with us in the process of liberating our country and directing our country's destiny. I am very confident that the alternative budget offers a viable roadmap, and to that end, it also addresses the most pressing economic issues of the country. And however, I must tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that the alternatives that you've heard from the leader of opposition and the adumbrations from fellow leaders, they're all brilliant, they're very good, but they cannot work in isolation. And that is why we must dedicate a significant portion of our efforts towards the Sarah Museveni and the Aaron Museveni dictatorship. And this is the reason. It's because no matter how brilliant our alternative policies may be, they simply cannot be implemented under dictatorship. There's no preoccupation is keeping power and nothing else. Once the regime falls, I am sure Ugandans will come together and discuss how they want to be governed and how they want to you know, allocate the massive, massive resources. We are very rich as a country. In fact, let me put it better. Our country is very, very rich, but we are very poor. Why? Because we are ruled by thieves. And the top thief, we all know him. That is the number seven. I want Michelle to say so. So I want to thank you for listening to me, ladies and gentlemen. We've had the beautiful speeches. We've had the beautiful uh, proposals, but they cannot work. They can't be implemented because we are being ruled by thieves. But if their intention is not to see Uganda develop, your life is not the issue. And that's why I'm very, very proud of you, Honorable Mpuga, and your team for making even the theme of your budget proposal a human rights given proposal, a human rights given budget. I thank you very much for listening to me, the world, and my country. Ordinarily, once the uh, main guest has spoken, that is it.
So uh, distinguished guests, once again, thank you very much. Thank you for turning up in such large numbers. I would like to invite you all to follow the team led by protocol to the steps of parliament where we shall have a group photograph. Okay, um, the team 